Welcome everyone to the Web3 Fusion Embracing AI and Beyond Conference, organized by the visionary team at DCN Global. I'm your co-host, here to guide you through an exhilarating journey at the intersection of AI, media literacy, blockchain, and the boundless possibilities mints. This conference is a beacon for those committed to fostering democratic, transparent, and resilient societies. Today, we'll delve into discussions that challenge the status quo, imagine new horizons, and explore how we can collectively harness the power of emerging technologies for the greater good. We have an incredible lineup of speakers, trailblazers in their fields, ready to share their insights, breakthroughs, and visions for the future. From keynotes that spark imagination, to panels that provoke thought and workshops that offer hands-on experience, there's something for everyone. Before we dive into our first session, let's break the ice. Why don't we start with a little humor? How do you organize a fantastic space party? You plan it. Now, with our spirits lifted and minds ready, let's embark on this journey together. Prepare to be inspired, challenged, and transformed. Welcome to Web3 Fusion, embracing AI and beyond. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Great. I will be your host for today, along with Mia and my chatbot. We're gonna do a lot of tests and different stuff today together. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, this conference, this Web3 Fusion and Beyond conference organized by DCN is our chance to understand all the new convergence in the technology. So uh, today we're gonna play, we're gonna test, we're gonna hear new exciting uh, opinions, new exciting news, perspectives, different perspectives from different angles of the world. Uh, and of course, uh, everyone is uh, uh, welcome to participate. We have outside three corners in order to learn more things and you can ask for the corners. We have AI, we have blockchain, we have uh, how to set up your avatar. Later today, we're going to see together our DCN verse, something that we built from last year's project and we have avatars and we are gonna have a huge uh, play together and the party in the metaverse. And uh, I will try to have a chat with my chatbot in order to uh, see. Can you welcome Nikos for the opening remarks? Certainly. Here's a warm welcome for Nikos. Please join me in welcoming Nikos to the stage for the opening remarks. As a visionary in the field, Nikos is shaping the Welcome, welcome, Nikos. Thank you. Uh, I think that after our session, everyone is not going to be me, but our avatar. actually the opportunity to share their thoughts and vision together with an excited audience and uh, as well as all of you the participants that we w that we aim actually to make it as a unique event this and global it, it is a community it's not a 
usual organization. It's much more a grassroots movement, a community that has been, been made up in 2015 based on an initiative of young people that wanted to create, to, to make the difference. These have, have been involved into this organization that you're witnessing now based actually on a very fundamental and very simple thing. How we, all of us, we can connect, share the things that we do, and make them even uh, bigger, larger, and more impactful. These are the basic foundation elements upon which DCN has been made up and continues to thrive. But most importantly, what constitutes our main fundamental element, it is you. The ones that actually participate, the speakers with whom we want actually to connect. Furthermore, this is not just another forum where we just meet and then we have, let's say, discussions, etc. But it is much more than that. It is as we have our motto, ideas in action. So we will discuss, we will present ideas, but the most challenging element it is how to turn these ideas into action. Being a university professor as well, I, I, will, I will emphasize the following, that Odyssey and Global, it has a unique element bringing at the forefront of uh, the research into a very practical element. And for us, this area is of the utmost important, along with our expanded world network, uh, where we have actually chapters in Americas, we have a chapter in Europe, in Africa, and Central Asia, in East Asia, and it, it opens up a series of other events that we will host in the area. Before passing the floor back to Dimitris again, I would like to thank our dedicated team, and especially the people that worked really hard in, our, in order this event to be realized, in order this event to be a unique one. And I will start by thanking Dimitris, I will start by thanking Mariana, Diana, Alisa, and uh, the whole team, Anna, Arthur, and Arben. As well as Vlad, which is actually the inspirator and someone that believed from the very beginning at this initiative, and he continues to, to support and strive it. Vlad, thank you very much. So, I promise to you fun, right? So I want everyone to stand up. Can we have some music? Can we have some music? Everyone, everyone stand up, don't be shy, we're a family. And I want you to do your thing, yeah, great. And your foot, and your neck. Come on, feel the vibe. You can start clapping. Great. Now I want you to turn to your next one and do a little massage in the back. We are in Thailand. So, do it, do it, do it. Do the other, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it, do it. Great. Don't be shy and then turn around again, turn around again. Super. Do it. Great. Great, great, great. I want you to be relaxed in order to start. Super. Now that we have the energy, give a huge round of applause to you. And we can start. You can take your seats. Thank you, thank you very much. Before we start to our first excellent speaker to talk us about the future and the mega trends, because we are from many, many countries, I want to create and uh, play with a slido. Oh, you, as you can see, we are a live action here, so I will give you the HDMI. Ta -ta 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 -ta. So, with this slido, I'm going to learn where are you from, okay? Sk 
scan the QR code, please. Can I see? Phones up, phones up. Scan the QR code. We're going to use Slido throughout the two days. And after that, we are going to do it by voice, because I don't want you silent. It's just 9 AM. OK. So OK. I see Philippines, Myanmar, Malaysia, United States, Taiwan, North Macedonia, Brunei, Korea, UK, Vietnam, Singapore, Laos, France, Indonesia, Romania. I know which Romania is. OK, Japan. OK, Brazil, Greece. I see a hello, nice country. I, I need the passport from the hello country. Great. Now let's see which country can shout better. Here we start from Philippines. OK. Thailand? Thailand? Mm. Come on. Brunei? Any other country that feeling shouting? Okay. <laughs> super, super. Give me just one second to get my HDMI in order to welcome together with my chat GPT uh, the, our next speaker. We're going to have it this back and forth. It's because we are experimenting. And this is what I want you to do also to start experimenting with new technologies in order for you to understand all the nuances. So can you help me welcoming Sermon? Of course. Thank you, Sermon. Here's a welcoming introduction for Sermon. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sermon take the stage. Sermon brings a breath. <laughs> We're looking forward to the insights and inspiration That's my you share. Welcome, Sermon. I want the microphone. Hmm? Okay, thank you very much, uh, ChatGPT. Is that ChatGPT? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But, uh, you know, I like the community vibe and the energy uh, that I just felt, you know, a moment ago. But I'll be speaking about, you know, the mega trends and the weak signals of change as far as the future of data is uh, about. And, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I would just like to show to you, as uh, you know, I've been pondering on this as a philosophical reflection over the years of my foresight practice. You know, that says, he who predicts the future lies even if it tells the truth. And this, uh, pro and this, yep, okay. So, uh, and this proverb shines a light or perhaps, you know, uh, illuminates uh, some aspect of what the future exactly is. And what is foundational to the idea of the future is that it doesn't exist yet, right? But definitely it will exist a moment from now. Second is that as far as data is concerned, there is no such thing as a future data. You know, how would you have a data wherein a data from the future, space or time that doesn't yet exist? The past have existed, but it no longer exists. You know, there was a question by Aristotle thousands of years ago, what exactly is the present? How thick is the present, really, right? And uh, it remained unanswered, you know, th thousands of years from today. So now, in the context of uh, the future, as far as data is concerned, I would like you to take note of the several things about the future, right? And then uh, try to understand what the future of data could look like, at least following the lines of what the future is, as far as uh, the assumptions that we make of it. One is that the future is entirely speculative. It is known to a certain extent through trends, but then a, a futurist friend of mine would say that the future is not at the end of a trend line. 
Another one is that, of course, you know, uh, we love to predict. It has always been our propensity to predict. We've seen that for thousands of years. 35,000 years of human civilization. We have, at different point in time, you know, uh, tried to make sense of the things that are unknown to us. And so, eventually, we would have oracles, forecasters, prophets, scientists, economists, futurists, 30 years ago. And until now, we've been trying to some sort of make sense and still actually st struggles, you know, to predict the future. But then as far as the future is concerned, its view is that no one can predict the future because it doesn't exist yet. However, if you are arrogant enough to predict the future, perhaps it is informed by many things like, for example, your biases, your interests. You know, uh, it's a business agenda or whatever that might be that we love to predict the future. But then, of course, when we rely too much on prediction, especially when it is informed by short-term trends, we might be missing a lot about the future. And then, of course, we all know this, that events can lead to different outcomes. You know, in a workshop that I had, uh, what, before the pandemic in 2019, together with uh, a number of chief technology officers and CT administration in the U.S., what they realized that, you know, Sherman, what I realized after attending this workshop was that we don't get to choose our crisis, right? They emerge in, in multiple ways. They are beyond control, something that you cannot actually manage before the fact or even anticipate, especially those types of crises that are not necessarily in your official reports on disaster resilience and management. So we prepare for the things that are known to us and pretty quite familiar to us. Another one is that when we think of the, about the future is that really truth is context dependent. It depends on where you are. It depends on the technology advances that you currently have. And it depends on the literacies that you currently have in, in, in many ways. It could be your uh, financial literacy. It could be your technology literacy, media literacy, digital literacy, among other things. Right? So... When it comes to the future of data, uh, this has been going on, you know, in different parts of the world about the ethics of it. You know, who's going to say about the ethics of data? Who's going to facilitate about the ethics of data? Because as far as I'm concerned, when I have a discussion with a political scientist in the Philippines, you know what, Sherman, data is not neutral. Right? It is informed and driven by systems, by ways of knowing, by belief, you know, by the interest you know, that funds what it is. And uh, with that, I just told you about, you know, how thick exactly is the future, uh, is the present. I would say that today we are trying to anticipate what the future is, really, at least from our, our perspective. But then what I realize is that our visions of the future, the way we anticipate possibilities, and make depictions of the future, like, for example, a science fiction writer or a futurist or a political scientist or economist or a technology solutionist, whatever we might call it, depending on where they at, is that the way we imagine the future are momentarily true. They are dependent on time, space, and person. Now, let me ask you this. You know, Voltaire once said, history never repeats itself, men always does. Right? Because there are certain values embedded in us that are recurring over time regardless of the epoch or period that we are in. Like greed. Right? The moral principles that we believe in, like happiness and joy and love. You know, these values are ca and, and characters, right? Or epistemologies or ways of knowing that we use to interpret the world enters through us and uh, probably... Walter was right, that men always thus repeats itself. But then, of course, there are several things and values in the world that will never change. You know, uh, there's this book that I've just read, Same as Ever. You might have read that book. I highly recommend that you read that book. That there are certain things that will remain the same as ever. So whether you agree with him or not, I think he has a point. That there are certain things in the world that will remain the same as ever, like, for example, our belief in what democracy is, 
right? Uh, it could be a multiplicity of truth about democracy, but the way people experience it, like for example, human rights are things that will remain the same. It could evolve, but probably, perhaps, you know, the nucleus, the core aspect, the dharma, I would say, of it will always remain the same. And sometimes, at least in the context of data, there are these things that we call megatrends. And most of the time, these megatrends, we, saw, we see them here and there, right? Like it could be an official report from the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, the Dubai Future Society, among other things. We always see this published almost every time, every quarter, about megatrends. And they tell us that this is the official view of the future. Right? Uh, that's important. That's very critical and crucial that, what, what, that we what need to know the megatrends. But then there are absurd ideas that enters our horizons of consciousness or change that challenges and disrupts the status quo and that we disown at the outset because we think that it is impossible because they are not yet a part of our data set. And then when they are not a part of our data set, they are unknown. We couldn't, we couldn't or perhaps hardly grasp what is it or what it is because we haven't experienced it yet. And we call these things fringe ideas or the weak signals of change. So what I'm going to do is to present to you some megatrends that we know already, at least in the context of how we know what data currently is at this point. OK, it's not moving. Uh -huh. OK, so just to show you how weak signals of change evolved through time, you know, uh, and this shows you that weak signals of change emerge from a particular community or a group of people that we call themselves probably perhaps esoteric. It could be through the form of art. It could be a fiction or a science fiction novel, a fringe writing or idea. And uh, in fact, this is what we call the foresight zone, right? Because that, they are most often than not in, not in our radar of a change. That's why they're called weak signals. You know, weak signals are like the small voices that you hear in your head that you tend to ignore. But then eventually, over time, they would evolve and become massive and big and that they would change the way we see normality. At the point of its origin, we call them ridiculous and preposterous ideas. But then, in fact, there is a profession that looks into these things, and that profession is what we call the futurist or a futurism. So uh, at one point, Albert Einstein said this. If at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. So what I'm trying to say here is that while there are official things, you know, the way we frame what data is today, if you try to rethink and reimagine the future of data, both in the short term and in the long run, you know, what would it look like? What would it mean if data or the future of data is absurd? And, uh, you know, Jim Dater, who is a, you know, a professor at the University of Hawaii, uh, said this once, and I think it's almost like similar to what uh, 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 Albert Einstein tried to you know, uh, accent weight was the idea is that, okay, the question was, what would a future, I when, when would a future idea become useful? You know, how does it look like for an, for an idea to become a future idea? And then as far as data is concerned, is that at the outset, it should appear ridiculous. Because if it's not, it's a trend, really. Like if you try to Google it, you know, or chat GPT, you know, the chat GPT can answer you, you know, in, in many ways. But then if you ask ChatGPT, like for example, ChatGPT, can you ask me something about genetic dynasty, right? Uh, embarking, like extracting from the idea, Isaac Asimov, ChatGPT would say, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I, either like he's gonna look into it or he doesn't know anything about it and that you can measure and that could be an indicator of a ridiculous idea. So another one is that when people say it, it will never happen and uh, nobody believes it. And, uh, you know, there is this group that looks really into this thing, and, and that is what you call futures. So, uh, but, but here's the thing, right? Like, there are many ways by which you can actually study the future. But what I would just uh, try to, like, uh, emphasize and highlight now is three things. The possible future, the preposterous future, and probably not necessarily the preferable future of data. Like, there are many ways by which heterogeneous ways by which we frame and understand what data and, uh, 
you know, figure out ways by which we can make it useful for us. But then it, when it enters the domain of public policy and governance and society, it becomes an issue of values, right? It becomes a value judgment, right? There will be deliberation, discussion, and our representatives or perhaps even the people would vote on it through a referendum like what they do in South Korea when they think about or envision some alternative future worlds that they prefer, they would post it as a referendum, right? So, but then of course, how do you exactly like pierce the future? There are many ways by which you can pierce it. You can pierce it at the systemic level. You can pierce it at the functional level. You can pierce it in the context of innovation and you can pierce it at the context of particular Particulars, like it could be a specific topic, issue, or an organizational context. And you use foresight to pierce the future of these four ways of using the future as an asset tool and resource to change and innovate today. But then, of course, uh, the way I do future, especially when I try to pierce the future of data, is that this is the process that I used, of course. One is that I would begin with a question. Because true, true question, it breeds curiosity. And through curiosity, it creates some sort of an appetite you know, for you to actually like, make sense of the future that you already know, which are your megatrends and those that perhaps you, are, you, have, you don't know about because they are not in your data. But then, you know, there are different competencies that you can actually build on, you know, to make sense and use the future as an asset to innovate today. And, uh, you know, you could build your competencies to question your assumptions about the future, build your competencies to discover it, build your competencies to scan and create alternative future worlds, build your competencies to transform, you know, your preferred future, if you have one, and uh, this apply design in order to curate it in a way that enables you to make it happen and generate insights and take action and reflect in the process. So, you know, here are some things that I saw, you know, when I scan, for example, like the megatrends of how we interpret and frame data is today. And uh, most of the time, we frame and contextualize data in these conversations, or perhaps thematic areas like data as a core strategic asset, data as a democratization issue, data as, a form, as, as exponentially growing, and then you also have artificial intelligence, and then you also have human augmentation with data, you have data privacy and security, you have edge computing, blockchain, data management, regulation and ethics, and interoperability and sharing of data. This is what the megatrends are telling us, right? Of course, these are the things that we talked about today. It's our news headline, if I may. Now, but what are the weak signals, really? Let's, let's try to look into what the weak signals are as far as the future of data is concerned. No, it's not moving. Okay. Now, what I normally do is that when I explore and unpack and discover uh, weak signals of change is that, of course, well, I have the data first, but then I think one of, uh, I would say, in my 15 years of practice, one of the most powerful approach to actually pierce the unknown is to question the future, right? So it has to start with human consciousness. And uh, like, for example, what might disrupt our framing about the megatrends that are influencing our ways of knowing what's possible about digital features? And we scan and discover it by questioning what the future of data is as we assume it today. And, okay, there's a bit of delay here. Okay, some questions that I would ask about the future of uh, data. Now, there is a, 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 a bit of delay about that. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Okay, some questions here. What if culture or indigeneity, I think this is pretty particularly important for Asia, was integral to digital consumption and development? Can this enable us to rethink the future of data as a form of relational reality? 
right? Because if, as far as the indigenous communities is concerned, is that relationality is reality and reality is relationality. The rivers, the trees, you know, nature is kin, is relative. Right. What if you frame the future of data in that context? What would the future of data look like? What if the digital was a public good? Would new forms of types of public good and services emerge? What would this be? What if digital technologies enable nature to grow and regenerate faster? Would the mountains, trees, rivers, and cosmos finally speak to us or converse with us? What if nature was a persona? What if nature becomes a part of the data? Or what if nature is data or the other way around? Right? What would the future of data look like? Now, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, just question it. Constantly question it. It does not require you to become a futurist. It requires you to question the future. You know, because if you question the future, if you question, for example, using, of course, embarking from the megatrends, that would enable you perhaps to innovate better. So uh, let's assume, like, for example, there are megatrends that propels the status quo and probably perhaps shooting for some incremental change. Like, you know, assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. You know, like, for example, if we assume that the future is the same as ever, some things will never change. Uh, of course, that's how, you know, uh, companies like Apple and Amazon extend the lifespan of their products, really. Right, like, you know, they maximize the status quo to extend the lifespan of their products. And we've been seeing that now. And, of course, we've seen that the Department of Justice of the U.S., you know, just filed a case against Apple, right, about... the you know, the business models and practices that they have to extend the lifespan of the smartphone. And how would you actually like some sort of spot the game changers? I'm going to give you some, you know, uh, emerging issues or weak signals of change based on research uh, and published by, for example, the Dubai Future Foundation, the World Economic Forum, and some other uh, agencies, uh, you know, investing on weak signals of change. One is your uh, materials revolution. What would the future of artificial intelligence look like if you m blend this with synthetic biology? You know, have you read the book Genesis Machine by Amy Webb? You know, in that book, Amy Webb asked, you know, the most advanced AI in the U.S., you know, if, there, if the robot, if you could dream, what would you dream about? And then the robot responded by, I want to be organic. Right? So is that the future of artificial intelligence? Another one is the issue concerning data devaluation. We all know this, that data diminishes over time. If they hack your data, your data becomes useless, right? That's why there is what we call cybersecurity, right? Because once they hack it, you know, you cannot trust that data anymore because somebody else has it. But then, of course, uh, as data devaluates over time, as they are replicated you know, uh, faster, for example, you know, and uh, one futurist would say this, that, okay, what is the future? One of, the, there are many future of economies, and one future that has been discussed about that now is what we call the exabyte economy, like the capacity of a nation to store information and process data as, as, at a much faster rate. Nation's economy will be measured by that. And given the fact that you also have synthetic biology as, as an issue, so what is the future of storage? And then some emerging issues are saying that the future of storage is genetics. And, uh, of course, we all know this, that intelligent systems are all potentially hackable, including genetics. And, uh, of course, uh, there has been a lot of conversation about this uh, concerning regenerative eco economies wherein the biological, digital, and human worlds connect to mitigate climate change and create value for ecosystem services. The Asian Development Bank recently published this. You can actually download it when they, where they have started triggering a conversation about regeneration in the future of economies, including digitization. 
And, uh, you know, this is pretty quite mainstream now, uh, but then it's not really there yet as far as regulation is concerned, is, you know, we, us, operating in a borderless world. And, uh, of course, your digital twins, uh, what would it look like if uh, everything is replicated and this evolves over time in the next 30 to 50 years? And then, of course, when will we learn to live with autonomous robots? At this point, uh, of course, probably we don't trust them yet. But at what time will we trust them, right? And uh, of course, as artificial intelligence emerge, you know, this uh, is an emerging conversation. How do we repurpose ourselves? And uh, of course, this is also related to health and nutrition because as data becomes more personalized at the level of genetics, this will become a public policy issue. And, uh, of course, the emergence of decentralized autonomous organizations. I've seen new organizations and trying to figure out what would they look like. And uh, a lot of conversation has been made about this, about decentralized autonomous organization. Now, how might we lead without authority? Right? Is that even possible? Leading without authority. Right? No, no one at the center of uh, the network. And, uh, of course, we've seen this. Many have said this. You know, the future of coding is no code development, probably. And uh, I had the conversation with a colleague last night about this concerning, you know, uh, localizing, customizing solutions, you know, at the level of uh, cost and uh, context, right? Like cheap innovation, low cost uh, technology. And uh, as we begin, as data becomes even more widespread, what would it look like for the informal sector to actually participate? in this marketplace. And uh, of course, the issue of over-reliance on mobile money platforms, uh, what are the risks related to this? Will it lead to monopolistic practices, increased fees, and systemic risk if the platform faces downtime or security breaches? And uh, of course, uh, I've seen this a lot recently, right? You know, wherein you have digital witchcraft and online sorceries. Right? Uh, there have been reports from some parts of the global south of traditional beliefs and practices such as witchcraft adapting to the digital era. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's awesome, I would say. And then, of course, uh, too much focus on technology uh, when you try to link this on uh, education, right? Like, uh, will, will this lead us to a techno-solutionist approach where technology is seen as a panacea for educational challenges? This can overlook deeper systemic issues, such as teacher training, curriculum relevance, and the digital divide, leading to uneven educational outcomes. You know, e-waste, definitely, right? Like, everybody's spending on data now. You know, uh, what, what's the future of waste? You know, uh, are they, are, are, is the Global South a dumping ground for hardwares? And, uh, of course, digital rituals and traditions. I've seen this happening, emerging in Australia, really, you know, for many of the digital platforms that are being innovated in that part of the world where in, you know, uh, indigenous tradition are uh, embedded in the way they build platforms. And uh, now, some potential features we, we see uh, data or perhaps digital future as a digital messiah where technology is seen as a savior promising liberation from economic, social, and educational constraint, yet potentially leading to new forms of dependencies and disenfranchisement. Or we will see a future of uh, the global village, suggesting interconnectedness through digital means, which can both empower and marginalize, depending on access and inclusion. Or will we see a future of what uh, I call the Pandora's box, suggesting interconnectedness through digital means, which can both empower and marginalize Again, I think it's, it's almost similar uh, to the idea. But then here's the thing, just to close this one. You know, there is no shortcut. There is no algorithm. If you all do is track what's trending, then all you'll ever know is exactly what everyone already know. To discover, you have to dig. I think the power of foresight, really as far as digital future is concerned, is continue to unpack and ponder the non-existent, the invisible futures. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Sermon. Thank you. Oh, I, I, can, I can take it. So, 
before we will continue to our next Slido and uh, our uh, next game, I would like uh, to thank also the U.S. Department of State Office of Citizen Exchanges for their continuous support uh, for DCN and funding and contributing uh, to this event. And I want you a uh, big applause uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. As a futurist myself, uh, this presentation was felt like home. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sermon. Uh, great, great contribution. Uh, working also as a DAO, uh, things are really, really critical right now, and all these weak signals are getting uh, traction. Before we go to our next uh, panel, I want to uh, ask for one second of the guys to remove my autonomous robot. Uh, has wheels, so it can be removed easily. Anna, can uh, w can we have the Slido? No. Okay. 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 So before we get the Slido, I will call for the panel discussion. So our next panel discussion is uh, diverse perspectives on emerging technologies. And uh, because we have time, uh, we, uh, we, we can have a discussion with you. Can I see hands which of you are interested in AI? Hands? Everyone, okay, okay. <laughs> now let's narrow it down. Uh, blockchain? Mm, we need a bit of work. Blockchain, not Bitcoin. Okay, it's a different thing. <laughs> Super. Uh, media literacy? Okay, okay, great, great. Space? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, because we live in a finite planet and we need to go for resources to an infinite universe. So it's okay. And. Uh, the final one, a peculiar category that you are working on that we need to uh, learn. Someone working in South. AI ethics. AI ethics. Okay. This is not a peculiar category, it's a necessity, but it's okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, I will call on stage. Michael Frank, founder of Seldon Strategies, intelligence expert, U.S. Uh, can you come on stage? Sankmin Bae, technical product manager, Amazon, uh, U.S. South Korea. Yoon, tell me the Wakaba Wasi. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, we can we can say it. Uh, and of course. Leon Gurevich, Associate Professor and Associate Dean of Research at Victoria University on uh, Wellington. A huge applause for all of them on stage. Let me bring... You can have one microphone. Yeah, yeah. We need one more. One more microphone. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. You can have it. I will join you. Thank you, thank you very much for being here. I will try to see you all. Okay, great. So, uh, we can start with a quick round because we have uh, time to introduce yourselves and also to say your surnames properly because I killed them. So, we can start. Sure, go with the hardest name, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's pronounced June Wakabayashi. So I'm actually half Japanese, half Taiwanese. Uh, I am born and raised in the US, but I moved down in 2015, been all over the place. But these days, I've been based out of Taiwan, where I've been living for the last seven years. It's OK to call you by. Call, call me by. How, how can I call you? June. June. Like the June. month, but no okay. E. Yeah, OK, June, June. <laughs> I, will, I will stay to June, April, whatever. Great. OK, yeah. Whatever. Thank whatever. you, thank you, June. You can pass the mic in order to, to do the introduction, and then I will start with the conversation. Hey, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Sung Min Bae, uh, born in Korea. Uh, now I work in the States for a company called Amazon. Uh, I don't know if you might have heard of it, but 
I work at, at a marketing science department within Amazon where we measure all of the campaign metrics and kind of brings uses AI to bring insights to our internal customers. Uh, I'm a also a side uh, investor. I'm really into crypto and Web3 developments. Um, also, I have my own side business that deals with plastic surgery. <laughs> it's a big thing in Korea, so I kind of wanted to get myself involved on in that field too. So nice to meet you all. Thank you, thank you. Oh, you have audience. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> Hi, Michael Frank. Uh, you pronounce my surname perfectly. Um, someone from Thailand can correct me, but my understanding is the word farang for foreigner is an ad adaptation of Frank, which is how you Europeans used to be addressed in Asia, the, seeing as all of the, the Franks, the French, the Germans, all their descendants. So someone can correct me if that's wrong. Uh, I've spent most of my career in Asia, actually. I lived in Hong Kong for six years. Uh, I was in Shanghai for a year, Tokyo for a year. Uh, I've spent many, uh, I've been to, to Thailand many times and traveled throughout the region. Uh, I'm now based in Washington, D.C. and plugged into U.S. foreign policy making. Um, I was at a think tank for, for a bit and now I'm leading an AI venture focused on uh, macro and geopolitical risk. But I'm very excited to be here today and speak with you all. Okay, hi. Um, my, uh, you know, I'm not even sure that I pronounced my own name right. So you, you're, we can you're off pronounce the hook. it wrong together. <laughs> yeah, to exactly, be, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so my name is Leon Gurevich. I'm um, associate dean research and innovation at Victoria University in Wellington. Um, but I also, along with my partner, we built a Hollywood grade film studio during the pandemic, which um, was an interesting experience. Um, and so, and for the last 15 years, I've been, I've had a research project that essentially maps um, migration patterns of tech industry workers into and out of New Zealand and around the world, um, specifically looking at the relationship between migration and innovation and how, how migratory people often um, generate new ideas, generate new dynamic businesses, um, new startups and specifically one of the reasons for that research was that uh, obviously I mean people are familiar with Lord of the Rings in New Zealand but what we started to notice in New Zealand was essentially a film industry the growth of a film industry spurred um, an entire tech industry in New Zealand so we now have Rocket Lab um, since you were talking about space we now have Rocket Lab the idea if you'd have told any Kiwi 20 years ago that we would have a um, a, a space industry in New Zealand, they would have laughed at you. Uh, we have a games industry, we have a biotech industry, and really New Zealand's way of leveraging, um, uh, even maybe even just to keep up with the global south, is to leverage uh, what it's done well into tech industries. So we call that from wool to wetter, um, wetter digital being the, the visual effects company that Peter Jackson founded. Super, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I want each one of you for two minutes uh, to describe uh, from your perspective the biggest challenges we have from a uh, technology perspective, from ethical perspective, from whatever perspective you uh, think uh, uh, it's critical uh, right now. Uh, you have, uh, we will have two minutes each and then of course if someone's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a casual discussion, always it's a casual thing with me. So uh, we can start with that. Uh, what do you think, from your perspective, it's a critical thing to do, uh, except from the alignment of the AI and the robots so that will kill us? Uh, but <laughs> uh, let's start with that. If you need some time, I can pass the microphone. <laughs> So just to repeat the question, um, yeah. what do I think is the critical thing to do? Common? Not to, to, to do, but something that is critical right now, uh, something that you think it's useful for the people to know as regards the emerging technologies and where we're heading and how do you think from a local perspective, from a global perspective, mm -hmm. uh, because you work on a startup, uh, Amazon, uh, the small company, mm -hmm. uh, you can share your opinion. Um, so I think we see this repeated cycle over and over again. I mean, right now, 
with the AI boom, I mean, we see the initial awareness where people saw that, oh, this thing actually works and right? brings a lot of benefit to us. And I think right now we're at a stage where we're going through the hype where there is AI, like for example, ChatGPT came out at December 22, and within two months later, they had 100 million users. Um, and I think we're gonna enter into a phase where hype is gonna eventually die out, and where hype meets the reality, and we kinda need to face, so where do we move on from here? And I think from a big, te big tech perspective, I think the more we know about AI, the more excited we are, but also at the same time, we are realizing how challenging this field is. Um, so I, I think from this audience perspective, I think we really have to kind of think about on how we want to move this technology forward, whether we want to bring an incremental value in efficiency or whether we want to do something more uh, by creating innovative ideas. Um, and I think right, right at, the, like, at the verge of kind of understanding whether we can kind of convert this AI concept into innovative ideas. But you know, just, back, just like what Sheldon says, you know, any, anything, that you know, any future idea should sound ridiculous. So it, it might sound ridiculous right now, but you know, the more we explore, the more we understand the field, even though it's, it's gonna get complicated, I think it's gonna bring some, something much more that, you know, that we couldn't really expect right now. But you know, looking into the future, it might, be, it might beca become a next unicorn, for example. Um, and I don't think it's something that big tech is you know, owning the everything for it, because you know, AI is open to everybody. Uh, so everybody has a chance to kind of utilize the technology. So I feel like advice is, you know, just, you know, explore, you know, just use ChatGPT if you haven't. Um, it's, it's a good um, tool to talk with, you know, even our friends, you know, just talk to ChatGPT maybe. maybe. Uh, so yeah, just, you know, utilize, explore, and have fun. We have a corner out there for ChatGPT. You can find friends there, so, okay. <laughs> It was, it was mentioned uh, earlier, AI ethics. I think that is the, the number one priority. Uh, and I say that as so, uh, an AI entrepreneur who's very excited about the technology. I've seen this technology do amazing things that we didn't think were possible even a year ago. I mean, the pace of change is extraordinary. But you cannot overlook the importance of translating AI ethics into governance. If we fail to do that, we talk about all of these good things, the potential that AI has. We are sacrificing all of that upside because people are only going to use these tools if they trust it, if they feel that it is not discriminatory, if it doesn't have biases against them, uh, if it's reliable. Uh, and the way we achieve that is by translating some of the, admittedly, some good work in the ethics community, but there has to be concrete governance. I agree. We are gonna. We're in a hype cycle right now. It, it is. It's. It's great to be leading a startup at this stage of the cycle. We're there's. That's going to come to an end. We'll have a trough. There's no doubt about it. But we need. We will shorten that trough and lessen the the scale of the dip if we can prove that AI is on a trustworthy, explainable development path. You know, and if, if you, you know, want a, an example of what the alternative looks like, you don't have to look much further than the, su the subject of this conference. Look at the, the blockchain experience. Demetrius is right. Blockchain is not Bitcoin, but blockchain has suffered mightily from scandals in crypt the cryptocurrency industry. FTX, the implosion and the destruction of a lot of people's value that they, they had invested in either the company itself or... Uh, in, in cryptocurrency on the platform, that has destroyed the reputation of this sector and it has taken a really, really long time to build, to, to recover that reputation and communicate what are the use cases that are actually gonna make people's lives better. I do believe, you know, I'm, I'm a lot less familiar with the blockchain sector than AI, but I think there are great use cases in that sector that integrate with uh, this, this AI ethics paradigm very, very well. Uh, but we took our eye off the ball in that early stage and said, well, let's, let's just let the market sort this out. And we're su still suffering the consequences of that today. So I think if, if you are a believer in the technology, if you are a believer in capitalism and investment and market development, you still need to believe in AI ethics as the first piece. That, that would be my, my most important message. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go on a slight tangent from a, uh, from a, the other panelists then. So I, I I think, and it's kind of the obvious one, and it doesn't seem like a technology one, but I think the number one issue we're facing, full stop, is is climate change in every way. Um, my mother lives in Scotland, and for the last two years, she said basically there hasn't been a winter there. Um, and last year, actually, in the last six months, her house flooded, and her house was not on a floodplain and is not in a, an area that would flood. Um, we're starting to see fairly remarkable and rapid acceleration, it seems, in climate change. Now, um, how do I relate this to technology? Well, I, so I'm a sociologist first and foremost, so the, 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 my starting point is humanism. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I had a research project called Google Warming. It's ongoing. I'm visualizing climate destruction, essentially, that you can put image data you can pull out of Google Earth and, and visualize certain climate destruction that you don't necessarily see if you just go to Google Earth because there's so much data there. Um, and one of the things that I noted in Google Warming was it, it used to be that when we had climate anomalies, when we had droughts, we used to say that this was because God was punishing us. And in the last 50 years, we've instituted an infrastructure in which God is no longer surveilling us. We are surveilling ourselves with satellites from space, and we're able to see what's being done. And so no longer do we pray, pray to God for a you know, climate savior. We discipline ourselves. We say we have to discipline ourselves. We have to change what we're doing. One of the things I've noticed recently is a, a rise in people saying AI can sort climate change out. And I think there's a real risk when we look at AI and we say AI is like a god that we can therefore, all these really worrisome things that used to be the domain of God and then were our domain, we can put back onto a technological god. And I would say, that the, so, and it does come back to what you were saying about AI ethics really, is I think first and foremost for me technologies are always human made. Uh, and there's a risk that if we have technological determinism in which we say all of the difficult things can be offloaded just to technology, we forget the fact that we are making the choices and how we create and deploy those technologies. And so I would still come back to what I would say is that any use of technology in any domain has to be done with an awareness that, that it is about how we channel, how we direct capital, um, what we decide we're going to build and what we decide we're not going to build uh, and how we how we create the rules of the road for capital investment in the right things and not the wrong things. Oh, great. June? Sure. And uh, just for context, right, so I'm here today representing a venture capital fund. Uh, I've been around for 15 years now, based out of Taiwan, and we invest in things like AI, we invest in blockchain, we also invest in emerging uh, markets such as Southeast Asia, it's what we call ABS for short. We've been doing this for 15 years now, have over 100 portfolios in the space. So we spent a lot of time really trying to understand what the future 10 years from now looks like, because that's effectively what we're doing in early stage investment. We're underwriting a future that happens 10 years from now. And so let's step back a little bit and try to understand the paradigm shifts. Every single time that there is a paradigm shift, in this world, there's massive, massive change underway, right? So if you kind of uh, rewind back a, a few decades and really understand what have been the major paradigm shift that hit us in the last 10, 20, 30 years, we had the advent of the internet, right? We had the advent of the PC, we had the advent of mobile roughly in 2008, 2010, and then now we're in the AI computing era. You could tag blockchain web three along with that as well. And every single time that there is a paradigm shift, there is also a subsequent transition period of both uh, education and uh, learning as well. There is a lot of value that is created with every single major paradigm shift, but there's also a lot of value destroyed. There's a lot of good created and a lot of bad created as well. And so now in this day and age of information computing, AI and it essentially replicates uh, information at scale, personalization at scale. And so when we think about that, uh, it's both incredibly exciting, but also incredibly worrisome, right? So I'll touch upon a little bit of both segments. On the good part, right, so we are at a point where um, 
computers can understand us better than ourselves in many ways. And now you're going to start interfacing with that in your every single day life, right? Just imagine a tutor, a near costless tutor that basically understands your exact learning style, right? In the traditional sense, you had to work with a teacher that worked with you one on one to understand how you learn, how you process information. Now, you know, the future in which a computer can do that is not so far away. Uh, similarly, you can think of on a financial investment front, right? You're going to have a financial advisor short of a human now. You can have a computer that basically understands your investment style, your risk appetite, and cater a strategy that is in line with what you want to achieve in terms of your retirement goals, right? So a lot of these human functions can now essentially be replicated with uh, computers and done at a cost that is now manageable and tolerable to the average consumer. So there's a lot of value that's going to be created, but on the flip, uh, on the other end, there's a lot of misinformation that's going to be spread. There's a lot of fraud that's going to be spread as well, right? And so I think about my mother who is now, what, 68 years old. And when I think about the type of scams that are going to crumb across the table and without me there to actually properly uh, filter these, I mean, she gets like all these random emails in her inbox and I tell her all the time, never click on those links that you randomly get that's, telling, that's trying to sell you Viagra or something. Listen, it's going to provide <laughs> you no value. They're going to uh, install some malware on your computer and they're going to spread some disinformation. And the thing is, th that was like very primitive level of fraud, right? Now we're at an age where the voices can replicate your relatives and essentially do some uh, social engineering to get access to your bank account. And it's incredibly scary. So really the issue at the top of my mind right now is digital literacy, right? That applies to both learning how to use this technology for good, but also how to identify it to mitigate any bad. And in Asia, we're actually incredibly bullish, right? This is the area that we focus on investing. They often say that the future is already here, but is uh, uh, unevenly distributed. And in parts of Asia, they just got done adopting mobile, you know, a, maybe on average 70, 80% mobile penetration. And now it's going to experience the leapfrog effect of adopting AI. But uh, what we're seeing on the ground now is just not nearly enough understanding of how to actually use and apply some of these models that are coming out, right? So uh, it's uh, essentially a call to action to many universities to start seeding uh, the curriculum to properly use these tools, help our younger generation become familiarized. Well, like many schools in the US right, right now are teaching kids how to code, right? We're now going to get to an age, I think hopefully not too soon from now, where they're teaching how to leverage these AI models in school, how to learn with AI. And that is something that needs to be done now so that in the future it is an investment and so that we get to the point where everyone knows how to use these models. There's not enough talent coming out of Asia right now. There's not enough. Uh, startups coming out of using AI, uh, but it's imperative that this part of the region does so right now so that they can stay competitive against some of the Western markets and their peers. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of different aspects and a lot of different perspective, and this is the case of this panel. Uh, I want to highlight, me and my AI, uh, I want to highlight two or three things that we can uh, touch upon in our next round. Uh, one is uh, the technology and inclusion, how we can ensure that the integration of these emerging technologies uh, into public services uh, promotes inclusion, accessibility, uh, on, uh, underserved communities. So we need to focus on that. And of course, the long-term sustainability, because in order to train these massive models, you need uh, gigawatts of energy just for three months of training. So uh, let's start from uh, the inclusion. Uh, inclusion is always uh, also a part of the climate. So I will uh, start from uh, your side. Okay. Um, I'm not hundred. So um, when you say inclusion, you mean uh, how we how we bring ordinary people along, or yeah. how we bring everyone along everyone. to have uh yeah i mean I, i've got to be careful because i feel like i'm going to start riffing on things that i'm going to say tomorrow in my talk and then everyone will get bored and leave halfway through but i, uh, I will close the doors don't yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um the i i spend it's funny uh, you know being a dirty academic i spend half my time looking back as much as i spend looking forward so i often i think about the industrial revolution uh, as a as a as an interesting example of a previous period when we had very rapid change, very quickly, 
Um, not necessarily that it's going to be the same this time round, but that the parallels sometimes are useful marker points or waypoints. So, you know, the, 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 and everyone knows this is almost a cliche, right? The Industrial Revolution brought a lot of very, very good things, but also you could see the, the, the ripples of revolution flowing down the next two or three centuries as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And so, so the question is this time round, when we have something like AI that can, if it can do the things that we think it's going to be able to do in relatively short order, and this is what I'm hearing from a number of, I've got a friend, ironically, who's in blockchain, and he was at a blockchain conference recently speaking to someone, and, and, and they were saying that they reckon within two to three years we'll have the computing capacity to simulate an entire brain, um, brain function. So, uh, and of course, it'll be very quick that we blow Passed that into kind of artificial super intelligence. Obviously, there's the questions about how do we, how do we make sure it's in a box, within a box, and all the rest of it. But I think the really interesting thing is, you know, there's, there have been previous times when we've had technologies that have profoundly changed our social and economic environment. Um, often, though, these technologies take 10, 15, 20 years to to come in. Everyone remembers that, you know. Eight years ago, people were saying that the self-driving cars were going to be everywhere by 2020, and it's 2024, and they're still not. A lot of the, those reasons are as social as they are. That so I think you know, if we showed someone from 2010 a self-driving car from now, they would say, "Yeah, you've done it," uh, but we haven't done it enough as far as we're concerned. So socially, it's not enough. It needs to be better than that. We, so we, we, there's a hype cycle, but there's also a social acceptance cycle, I think, on new technologies. Anyone who wore Google Glasses when they first came out in the New York subway would have experienced this. People were calling them glass holes. Um, you know, they were not very popular at all, so yeah. Google had to pull it. Uh, the question, I think, right now for us in terms of inclusion is, is AI... Is it going to come, is it, it, will it almost be a tsunami that overwhelms the usual processes of social uh, onboarding? I.e., will, will it be so useful so quickly that everyone starts to um, say, well, we can, we, I don't need to go to university. I've got a digital tutor here that can do it. It reminds me a little bit of, and, and I sometimes think that academics are the, the, the vinyl records of our time facing a, a tsunami of CDs where everyone's saying we can get rid of our vinyl. <laughs> I wonder whether you, you, you could see decimations of industries and then the realization afterwards that actually there were aspects of those industries that were good and that we need to bring back. And the question is, is once you've got rid of certain things, is it hard to bring them back? So from an inclusion point of view, I would say there's the onboarding and how fast onboarding can happen or not. But there's also the kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater that can happen as well. And those would be my two concerns as far as inclusion are concerned. Okay. You know, I think um, it's important to, to recognize that we live, humans have inherent bias. And we may approach this, this new world with this view that we need to eliminate bias. I'm skeptical we can, we can do that. I worked at the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is the, the, the sister business of the uh, Economist newspaper for a long time. And, and I always thought it was interesting you know, to hear from people who would say, I love the Economist. You're objective. You're unbiased. And I'd say, we are absolutely biased. We, we have a liberal worldview. Uh, that you know, very much uh, rooted in the British view of liberalism and we're a values-based organization. We are trying to advance our values. Um, now, is that offensive? I think there are, there are worldviews that are more offensive than what The Economist stands for, but the, the point is that uh, a bias is a problem if you don't acknowledge it exists. Exactly. Th then, then you, or if you have a malevolent bias, of course that's a problem. But um, let me give you an example here too, because I think often these conversations of bias are kind of rooted in, in you know, too, too high of a level. Even in very high stakes applications of technology, it comes back to what you said at the beginning, T 
technology reflects what humans tell it to do. So in the United, I come from the United States. We have a legacy of institutional and structural racism in our country. One of the highest stakes applications of technology that we have ever seen is in the criminal justice system in sentencing. There are, there are cases, there are systems that, are, that use algorithms to determine system yeah. exactly to determine yeah. how long how uh, long of a sentence uh, a convicted criminal should receive there is indisputable evidence that if a black man and a white man commit the same crime in the United States on average the black man receives a harsher sentence that is indisputable now how do we fix that problem if we use an algorithm that's trained on historical data and you don't account for that bias we are just going to perpetuate that historical injustice. But there are two possible solutions here, I th as I see them. One is you strip out race as a factor. We can do that with, with statistics. It is possible to, to remove the effect that race, gender, other types of protected classes have on the, on the outcome. That is we know how to statistically do that. In practice, we often fail. The other option, is to only use the data historically for white men and grade everybody against the same scale. Now, those are two completely different approaches, right? One is we essentially say we are gonna take a, a, a race-blind approach. The other is not race-blind, it's race at the center of your solution. Either way, if you can actually execute one of those paradigms, you are potentially not only eliminating the, the bias from your model, you are moving us in a direction in that system that is much more equal and fair and just than we have had historically. But it comes down to one, knowing that there's a problem, and two, agreeing that it's actually a problem we need to solve. And those two questions have nothing to do with the technology and they have everything to do with human sociology. Okay, so I am looking at this question in terms of how can we kind of integrate some of the technology that we have right now into our lifestyle. And I mean, when I kind of look at this high-end technology, I think there's a trend where people kind of overestimate the effect of technology in the short term and underestimate the effect in the long term. And in order to, you know, for us to kind of truly integrate this kind of technology around us into our lives, I think the biggest factor is, you know, having a, uh, constant interactions with some of the bright minds, such as like having this DCN event, for example. Because I feel like, you know, sometimes you learn more just talking to a people uh, for five minutes than reading an article on the internet for two hours. Um, I'm, out, I'm lear learning something new, and I think it's the ability, for your ability to kind of cross-check some of your facts that you have, and also ability to kind of determine uh, some of the information that you want to intake, and some of the information that you don't want to intake. And I, I think this kind of conference or just interactions with different, different people within different field kind of help us kind of understand um, where the excitement is, where you can really feel a sense of excitement to a virtual call, but physical interaction with people kind of tells you uh, what are some of the things that people are excited about or what are some of the things that's trending right now um, and kind of help us understand where I want to be, uh, where I want to move forward within this technology trends. Because I think our capability is kind of limited to how much information that we can observe within a day. Um, so I feel like um, the biggest part for us to kind of integrate this technology within our life is kind of uh, talking to a lot of people and kind of understand uh, what kind of excites you and what you want to make sure that you, you, you want to fact check, you want to cross check some of the people, uh, and how you want to utilize that information uh, by talking to different people and kind of expand your network. Uh, so to help me better answer your question, um, based on the responses you heard so far, how did that align with the original expectations? What were some of the original unknowns in your mind that you had when you asked that question? Oh, my unknown is how we can create different, let's say, competencies uh, in order to have a more fair uh, use of emerging technologies. For example, bias is one, because bias uh, cutting the technologies, all the others. 
everything that we can use as an idea or as a perspective to be more inclusive, to have more people on board uh, from educational perspective, from uh, algorithm perspective, from uh, climate uh, usage perspective, whatever, uh, from a funding perspective also. So uh, this is what I'm uh, waiting to hear. And of course, we are going really soon to get some questions from the audience because I'm uh, hearing Slido boiling uh, on the background. Uh, so this is the, uh, the case. In order for, uh, for everyone and uh, the ones that uh, see us online, we have uh, a lot of people online streaming right now, uh, to, to understand how we can make it a more uh, inclusive society through emerging tech. Because there are different point of views, uh, the super high tech uh, people that they say, okay, technology will solve everything. We have the other ones, oh, no human is in the center and technology must follow. We have other ones that say, no, no, policy is in the center and we need to uh, regulate everything. We have people that says, uh, we are screwed, we need to pray to God to save us. Uh, we have different opinions. So uh, according to your point of view, what we can do in order to have a more inclusive uh, society, a more inclusive. Is there a particular group that you think is being excluded? Because by your question, that, mean, that also assumes that there are people that are not being accessed the same resources, right? Uh, yeah, because I think that uh, in different parts of the world, different categories don't have access to this kind of uh, digital literacy, for example, uh, like uh, uh, older people. Uh, and through AI, we can help older people. This is a use case that we can do. Or uh, from the financial perspective, people that are in regions that they don't have uh, financial means or direct ac access to venture capitalists, uh, and they need to travel or to move their business to Silicon Valley from, from the south part, or Singapore from this part, or uh, Taiwan. I, I don't know a particular the region. So uh, I want to hear a specific uh, or something as an abstract opinion about how we can use a part in order to. And uh, Mariana, if we can have Slido in order to uh, start getting questions from the audience, because so I'll share a few of my thoughts. Uh, more Great. specifically about this topic of inclusion, I actually don't think there's too much extra we necessarily need to do at the moment because what these paradigm shifts do is essentially reset the playing field. And that actually applies to both AI and blockchain, right? So uh, on the AI front, it's essentially democratizing access to knowledge, right? Uh, suddenly, you know, um, a very poor kid in rural parts of emerging markets, whether it's in Southeast Asia or Africa, if he has a very limited connection to the internet, can suddenly benefit from uh, the uh, learning from a chat GPT, right? You could essentially get what is equivalent to elementary school education just chatting with this, uh, this uh, program. And that historically has not been possible or accessible or effective for that matter. Uh, same thing with things like blockchain, which at the root of it is all about decentralization, right? So typically in the Web2 area, you would need an intermediary institution to essentially pick and choose how resources are allocated. Now under the scheme of decentralization and self-governance from the people, by the people, it is now very much driven by meritocracy. No matter how rich your nation is or how poor your nation is, suddenly markets like Taiwan, which historically have suddenly have been overshadowed by larger markets or bigger GDP, higher GDPs per capita, now they actually have access to the same type of resources through things like ICOs, for example. You can raise funding uh, from people all over the world who believe in your project, and they won't be denied by the regulatory authorities who think, oh, you don't know anything because you're not a high net worth individual, right? Of course, there are a lot of risks with that as well because these intermediaries did traditionally serve as a safeguard to protect consumer interests. However, um, I think in this day and age where information is ubiquitous and infinitely accessible, um, you need not underestimate the average 
human. <laughs> they have access to a lot of resources now that simply just didn't exist before, right? Uh, typically, what the average person has access to on a computer is something that the most sophisticated investor just 10 years ago would have begged for and paid millions of dollars for, right? So we are now in a day and age where people have this information access that they did not before, and if, you know, going to your question, how can you improve it, it's really just about education and understanding of what is available at their tips, right? There are new tools now being entered into the fray, so how exactly do we go about unlocking the value from this is educating people on how to use it, and those things are already in place. From our standpoint, like founders, like uh, for us, it's important that founders really toy around with these technologies so they get familiar with it, iterate, fail a little bit, so that when the rising tide does take over, when these technologies do become ubiquitous, they are in a very, very pivotal position to take advantage of it. NVIDIA, for example, five years ago was worth $60 billion. They're now a $2 trillion company within a span of five years. So when these things hit, they hit real big. And that's why we run a st free equity-free startup accelerator for any uh, entrepreneurs who are willing to play in this area. And we had a focus on allowing these entrepreneurs to toy around AI and blockchain since 2018. That was before ChatGPT was a thing. That was before ICOs were a thing. Because you recognize the potentially paradigm shifting potential of all these technologies. That's why it is important to go back to my point about digital literacy. Uh, start now, start early, and so you'll be adequately prepared for the future. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. We are going to some questions from Slido. Uh, in the tick boxes, you can vote also uh, the questions in order to go up. I will read it to you, it's okay. Uh, so, uh, we have a question about blockchain. From your perspective, what is one idea or meaningful uh, implementation utilizing blockchain tech a nation can apply and benefit from immediately? Except from Bitcoin, okay? <laughs> so, uh, who wants to get first? I can apply. I can reply in order to give you some time. According to my opinion as regards, a nation can apply and benefit uh, uh, for immediately. I'm, I'm running a project right now. I'm in uh, the Special Secretary of Strategic Foresight in the Greek government. So uh, what we are doing, we are trying to utilize blockchain. And as you understand, when you are speaking to a small government about blockchain and metaverse and uh, all other things, they say that, okay, we have other problems to solve before blockchain. So uh, one big thing about blockchain is that it has an immutable nature. If something uh, is written on a public blockchain, can never be, let's say, undo or uh, erased. Uh, we use this kind of blockchain technology for the land registry. So in order to digitize the land registry, we have a case that we are starting to digitize the land registry. And instead of just digitizing the existing papers, we have papers from the first Greek revolution with uh, uh, the handwritten uh, of the king and all the, that stuff that are okay. These are artifacts of history and we want to preserve it, but they are not useful in order for someone to search for a house or to see the registry of a land. So uh, we did a leapfrogging and we got from digitalization to just public records to create a public database of these records to write them directly into the blockchain. So we have uh, a plan of digitizing every land uh, and every uh, registry record into the blockchain and eventually, because during COVID we had a huge acceleration in uh, uh, giving everyone a wallet, to have a QR code, to have the vaccination certificate and all that stuff. So we're going to use this wallet to have uh, also their land certificate. So the, we have the wallet, the ID, we have the uh, license and the license plates and the vehicles right now. Uh, and we are going to have also land registry and uh, hopefully all the certificates and every uh, university degree that you have. So you will have a, uh, a wallet that this is your, let's say, proof, digital proof of ID because 
uh, it's very difficult in the European Union context to not have a physical uh, one. This is one of uh, my example. I'm uh, waiting for yours. Yeah, yeah, you can. I see that you have everyone, so we can yeah. go one minute each, or okay. one minute and a half. I, I actually, I mean, I'm, I'm going to kind of end up responding with a meta answer, which is... Oh, super. Um, and I don't mean meta answer as in Facebook either, but um, uh, I, I, think the, I think the real risk is around adequately um, evaluating the risk. So I think the, you know, there's the, Donald Rumsfeld once famously stood up and started talking about unknown unknowns and everybody kind of laughed at him for it. Um, for lots of reasons, but you know, I look back at what he was saying there, and I always think it's actually quite interesting because he was right. He was he was trying to say the real risks are the risks we don't know are risks, and the real risks are in incorrectly f identifying the wrong risks as the main risk. And so, with AI, I think the, the, the and blockchain, the real risk is that we it's the thing about you always fight the last war, right? So. So the risk is that we look at the problems that we've had with social media and we say we've got to make sure those things don't happen again with AI and AI isn't social media. So yes, data is important. Yes, individual data is important. But if we just focus on how AI could be a, a risk and a threat to the violation of pr pr personal uh, information and data, we might completely f uh, miss the fact that AI has unbelievable capacities in aggregate in being able to spot trends and, 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 and work out pathways uh, uh, looking at 8 billion people all at the same time. And, and what are the unknown risks of that? That's what we need to identify. So uh, for me, the biggest risk is inac inaccurate and in, in inadequately identifying the risk. And that requires, I think, profound creativity for us to actually sit down and war game what are the risks. That would be my, my answer. Yeah, the known unknowns is the base of foresight science. So yeah. <laughs> I, I can't believe we're sitting here in 2024 and saying Donald Rumsfeld was right about anything. <laughs> but I actually do agree with that. I do agree. Um, where's the group from Malaysia? Yeah, Malaysia, do you, do, are you aware you have probably one of the greatest blockchain startups, in my opinion, at full disclosure, I'm an investor. Uh, okay. Full <laughs> no, we'll disclosure. <laughs> but a company that was started as Fusong, now is trading as Blocktree, I believe. But um, they have uh, issued the world's first sukuk, Islamic banking, a bond. Uh, this is not the most exciting application of blockchain, maybe. But if you think about what that what problem that solves is in financial markets you have a fundamental problem of trust and there's an entire industry around i have this person who's selling a bond or a stock or whatever they're selling some sort of security and this person who's buying it there's a person in the middle that says we are going to guarantee that this trans transaction takes place so that this person doesn't lose their money blockchain can serve that purpose to eliminate the need for that trust, and you know, it, does that seem like uh, you know the, the the of the applications we were promised? That do people uh, wake up in the morning excited to change the world through uh, issuing bonds? You know, maybe not, but what you're doing then is removing maybe 20, 25, 30 percent of the transaction cost uh, across the financial markets. Think of how much money that adds up to. I mean, we're talking an astonishing sum of money that there will be some value capture by companies uh, like Fusong Blocktree uh, that they will, they will earn, but a significant amount of that money will go back into the pockets of the people who are involved in that transaction. And for governments who are issuing bonds, Obviously, this is great, right? You think, think of what that translates to in terms of government finances over the long run. Uh, you know, 20 to 25 percent of transaction costs can be a huge deal, especially in this part of the world where, you know, it's, it's not the U.S. government, it's not the Japanese government that have the, the benefit of essentially dictating their own terms to markets uh, in terms of borrowing. Uh, the, there are, you know, always higher interest rates, there are tighter margins, 
And this is, to me, a really exciting use case that we're already starting to see and, and hopefully will proliferate. Just a quick question. Uh, is, is there a risk to the dissolution of the need for trust? A absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I think your point about we, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know. Um, if we move too quickly and we have scandal, we have, um, uh, you know, we have use cases that go awry, it comes back to the point I was making earlier, which then that wipes out the potential. Um, so I do think it's important not to rush head first into these types of applications. Uh, but, but something like that, where there are already some use cases, uh, I think that is an exciting opportunity. Uh, I, I, I think you know, issuing bonds is, is generally not a life or death situation. I wouldn't move into uh, you know, provisioning healthcare services or, or, or other more essential government services using blockchain yet. Uh, but the nice thing about this evolution is, you know, you learn from the mistakes of the preceding evolution. As long as you keep your risk profile adjusted to reflect that, uh, you, can f you can fail small enough that you learn without turning off pe the people that you need, the stakeholders that you need to be invested in the success of a technology. Okay. Um, so I'm going to more focus on how can you kind of use the blockchain technology as of today, to build something that we can actually do something with it. Um, and I think the usage of blockchain doesn't need to be, I mean, banking is also a great example, but I think uh, within the APAC and within the Southern Asian Asian culture, I think one thing that we can utilize blockchain for is you know, utilization of blockchain to kind of itemize some of the IPs that we have. I think all of us have a great uh, historical record of cultures, uh, architectures, and one great example that I can give is I had a chance to work with uh, Gaudi's architecture. Um, I, I don't know if you might have heard of it, but they wanted to kind of itemize all of their uh, buildings and architecture design uh, through, through a blockchain technology. And by utilizing that, they were able to kind of use the IPs to open up a pop-up store and maybe sell some of the IP, IP that they produce to use the blockchain technology to make actual money for, uh, for some of the historical, um, historical systems that, you know, that they didn't really have opportunities to do it. And I think within, within the Asian cultures that we have, um, I think it, s similar to the policy that we went yesterday, I think that we have a great sense of colors, we have a great sense of histories that we can kind of utilize and even a uh, movies on a Netflix, I think we can even try to itemize that through a blockchain technology and maybe try to use that opportunities to uh, make more money by opening up a pop-up stores or creating a uh, NFTs uh, out of it and maybe selling it to other people or stakeholders who might be interested in. Um, so I think there's some of the real life examples that we, where we can utilize blockchain technology to, I don't know, make money, for example. Great, thank you. Uh, I just a few, few thoughts to add, I guess. Uh, you know, going back to the original poster's questions, it's ironic because in many ways embracing blockchain is essentially taking a hedge against governments and authorities. Right? These are self-sovereign, self-governing type of organizations and communities here in the crypto Web3 realm. That said, though, uh, blockchain does go beyond uh, just sheer cryptocurrencies. And so two governments, uh, at least on a countrywide level, number one, I would encourage you to not take a blanketed approach and really think about things from first principles, right? In many ways, there are things that blockchain is great for, but other things that blockchain is terrible for. It's not a great scalability tool. So what is blockchain good for? Uh, primarily it's used for things like provenance uh, and understanding um, essentially the originality, authenticity, and also the immutability immutable nature of it in that it can't really be changed, right? So think about aspects of your country in which uh, operations could benefit from that. Traditionally, anywhere that there's been an intermediary leverage, that might be a potential use case. Things like, I don't know, real estate transactions, putting Ds on the blockchain, or even putting uh, diplomas on, on an education sense on the blockchain to really maintain the authenticity of their records. Uh, for me, personally, as an American expat living in Taiwan, I think uh, cross-border remittances is a huge uh, area that I find incredibly fascinating through the use of things like cryptocurrencies. 
um, you know, you've been able to reduce a transaction cost and the time to settlement by uh, a fraction. And that's been incredibly tantalizing for me, otherwise using very archaic Swift systems that you know you pay 30 to 50, 60 dollars and take two to three business days. That is just unfathomable in this day and age, right? But suddenly with these networks now, decentralized networks, you're able to get it done, wham, bam, done. I think a great example was, you know, not to get political, but uh, when Ukraine entered its war, Russia, they actually received donations through cryptocurrency networks, just like that, which would have been otherwise inaccessible to them. So there's been a lot of good created out of this, but still, nevertheless, again, approach things from first principles, don't copy and paste. Otherwise, you're gonna run into the problem of finding a solution uh, prob oh wait, find, basically trying to find a nail. Uh, you have a hammer and basically trying to find a nail to hammer in with, right? And that'll lead you down a very, very bad path. And when you have a hammer, everything s seems like a nail. <laughs> so uh, we, have, we are going to have one more question, uh, some logistics, because everyone here is here for two days. All the speakers are here with us for two days. So you can go and ask things, you can go and introduce yourself, you can go and scan as many QR codes you have about all the social networks. So uh, if we leave some questions that are unanswered, we can go through, uh, through coffee breaks, you can hand them down to breakfast or whatever. So uh, everyone is here, don't be shy, go introduce yourself, ask a question, everyone is uh, here to network. So uh, I would like to hear from all speakers in one sentence, in one sentence, okay, uh, how Web3 and AI can meet and synergize. This is our winner, has 10 votes. I, well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, very simply, right, uh, AI is essentially infinite for application, so they, they're very, very complementary to each other because with AI, there's infinite replication, so at some point, you're gonna need a way to prove authenticity, which is where blockchain comes in. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, we can call it one sentence. <laughs> I'll, I'll do one word if then that buys me like a paragraph. Is that a fair trade? Uh, no. Uh, Half yeah, a paragraph, we, 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 okay. can, we can have it. What, Say one word. What, one word is trust. But the reason for that is we are gonna see a devaluation of the truth with AI. And I know we're exploring misinformation throughout the next two days. Blockchain is a possible remedy for that because my view is this is gonna filter people's attention towards trusted sources, and blockchain helps to ensure the validity and the credibility of information. There's a, there is a role for blockchain to play. I think we're, it's early to say exactly what it is, but trust. One you, word or you're one You're gonna sentence? like my one sentence. Okay, yo, give it. What he said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess one thing that I can say is just embrace the technology. I know that it is a security field. Uh, I know that we're gonna learn more about it within the next two days. But I think first thing is, yes, trust is also a big thing, but you know, you need to open up your heart up and kind of embrace the technology to kind of you know, take that information into your heart and you know, share the goods and maybe also the bads with other people who's interacting around you, so. Okay, great. Uh, we, have, we have another one that pops up and has votes and we, I think that we need to demystify that because it's a, for, for, for many of uh, the people out there is a challenge. Do you believe that AI holds personal entities? In other words, can AIs can fall victims of se sexual harassment or such a thing? We can start. Um, my, my strictly answer is no. They are uh, models that they are not sentient, these models are trained on data, so they, uh, they hardly understand w what sexual harassment is by reading piles of text about sexual harassment. So they cannot feel or be threatened. They don't have conscious yet. Uh, so my point of view, my personal point of view, uh, my really, really personal is no. But we have the floor. I'm, I'm going to say maybe. Ooh, 
ok uh, I mean obviously there's there's theorists like Bruno Latour that talk about technology as being actors and, and they say we've got to accept that and this was before AI he was saying technology can be actors um, uh, one of the things that really really got to me in the last year I thought was really interesting was watching Jeffrey Hinton the you know one of the many but he gets called the father of of uh, neural networks say that he was not confident that these things were not sentient by this point. Now, the reason that that was interesting to me is that he was the head of uh, Google AI's, uh, you know, Google's AI push. He stepped down to be able to say this. Jeffrey Hinton's not, he's not, he's not the guy that got fired from Google for turning around and blowing the lid on thinking that they're sentient. So I think, I think the issue is we don't know, and and also I think it'll be difficult for us to know for a long time. Like, th th where does the threshold, when do we cross that threshold is another question. I mean, h how do we even know any of any of each other are sentient um, when we talk to each other? And this, th what what is interesting to me is that it's enough of a grey area that someone's even having to ask this question. That to me is really interesting. and. As a result of that, we are going to increasingly get into more and more, compl more and more complicated world around AI ethics, both for how AI are interacting with us and how we are interacting with AI. And that, to me, is the interesting thing. Okay, the singularity is near answer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think that any systems today are sentient or or close to sentient, but I think there's a very good chance that in the future we will have to confront this problem. There will, there, there's a good chance there, there will be sentient AI systems. It's just a matter of what our time frame is. I would, I would offer up though, even in that scenario, I think this might be an easier problem to solve than I think that the implication of the question. Um, if you are engaged in, if you're harassing somebody online today, any, anywhere in the digital space, there are technical ways to, to block that behavior. You can have a secondary system that is monitoring what you're typing in on your phone or your computer or, and, and say, we are not going to ingest that information. We're not going to pass that on. You know, right today, it's, it's something that could happen in social media and say, we're not going to let you post that information or send it in a message. But you could easily imagine a scenario where, where an AI company says, we're not going to let you send that in, that prompt into our ecosystem. Uh, open source is entirely another issue, but you know maybe we'll get into that later in the, the conference. Uh, from a product management perspective, same answer as you know no, uh, because I think it's not the model itself who has sent in, but it's the data itself that we're working with where model become biased because of the data itself is biased. But from a personal perspective, I say yes. Uh, that's just because, I mean, it's kind of hard on, it, it depends on how we define um, like emotions, for example. I mean, um, I had this damagochi, which is like little thing that you play with, and I felt, you know, like, happy or loved because of the little characters that I play with, play with. So I think it really depends on like how you look at it from different perspective. Um, I think for people who might not know the technology very well, I think they, they might say yes, because you know, they, they can really fully distinguish the difference between you know, some of the words that people are saying. Um, and there are people who are kind of using that as a, their advantage to I don't know, maybe host scams and et cetera. So, um, from a technology perspective, no, but I think from a personal pers perspective, um, I say yes. <laughs> okay. Jun? Uh, yes, similar, like, not yet, at the very least. I, I just don't think we're at that point yet. AGI is still uh, quite far ahead of us, but I think in this current day and age, what would be more interesting is understanding the liability behind bad actors in the AI space, who is going to be held responsible, is it the companies, is it the coders, is it the corporates of data in which the model was trained upon. And that's something I think you'll hear about in a panel later today with regarding with uh, AI ethics. Uh, but for now, short answer is no. Okay, great. Can uh, I, yeah, yeah, of course. Just, just a really, really quick follow-up. I think the other thing to say about this is, the question is, are you talking about AI models sexually harassing humans or humans sexually harassing AI models? Because the other thing about that is, even if you had an AI model that was sentient, if it's not embodied, then you start to get into a weird philosophical world of, of what, what, e what even does sexual harassment mean 
if you're dealing with a system that does not have a physical body and and there's all sorts so there's all sorts of questions but then if you're talking about AI models sexually harassing people well I mean we we have seen uh, AI models go off the rails already and start to behave in very very creepy ways when they got pushed too far in certain ways so it, it's an interesting area not not least because the the initial question is more complicated than it looks exactly but uh, from uh, a digital perspective and from a legal perspective sexual harassment uh, can be a digital offensive in written words or during a chat so uh, we can have it vice versa uh, I think that the question was more if a model can be offended and uh, I'm not speaking about Victoria's Secret models about the AI models so uh, the concept of an AI model being offended from a data analyst perspective that is uh, my training, uh, I don't think so. We can have biases and we can have a model that is trained out of data of sexual harassment and can be the best harassment uh, tool ever. Of course, we can trade that. Uh, imagine that if we train a model with uh, uh, literature from uh, early 90s to uh, 1950s, we even have someone that uh, thinks that uh, uh, women are not equal and uh, they don't need to vote and stuff like that, just by taking literature a century ago and just giving it to a model without any alignment. So uh, that is the case. We have three, four minutes more. Uh, we, uh, we have one more winner that has 11 votes. I would like to hear from all speakers. Oh, no, no, this is we already told it. OK. What's your thoughts on organizations or governments going backwards when it comes to digital transformation just to avoid the problems? Uh, let's be concise, not in one sentence, but in two, in order to get one or two minutes more coffee break. I think there's a risk of governments being performative on digital transformation policy. Um, this may not be a popular view, but my personal opinion is the data protection legislation we've seen in this region, I think is performative and counterproductive. Um, and in the interest of keeping it short, if you're curious why I think that, happy to, happy to chat offline. Uh, it's important to actually address the underlying problem, not just, to, to, not just be seen to be doing something. And in order to achieve that, policymakers themselves have to be informed on what the issues are. OK. Um, I mean, I have a slightly, a slightly unusual perspective for no other reason than because I live in New Zealand and we've only got 5 million people. I mean, I, I, the way our government operates is quite different from a lot of governments. Uh, when I think about COVID, the reason New Zealand ended up in a very, very fortunate position was that its government was very, very close to its people. So it was um, because there's so few people there and because the se degrees of separation, they reckon every person is connected to every other person by two degrees of separation in New Zealand rather than f you know five to seven in the rest of the world. Um, so that being the case, the New Zealand government doesn't tend, to, what it tends to do is it's a little bit like it's got Apple's strategy, which is it sits around and watches what everyone else does uh, and then it tries to implement systems later on, but better. Um, it tries to learn through other people's mistakes, but then it tries to, and it genu genuinely tries to work in people's interests. So I think that the question there is as much about what kind of government you have and, and what that government's aims are, and, and that will be dependent on where you are in the world, I think. Okay. Uh, in short, I think it's normal. I think that pendulum will always swing back. Uh, very similar to Adam Hand's invisible theory, right? Uh, it's a self-correcting mechanism. If the government is too heavy-handed, the industries will employ thousands and armies of lobbyists to eventually push back. Uh, industries and companies will still continue to innovate. It will eventually get into the hands of consumers, and governments will have to respond accordingly. So it's always going to be a constant ebb and flow, which is quite healthy. The only thing that governments have to worry about is completely taking the oxygen out of the air and completely stifling innovation. That's something that will be the uh, the nail in your coffin. Yeah. I agree with everything that this guy says, so 
<laughs> nothing more. Um, yeah, I think government nature are slow, uh, but eventually, you know, if we have louder voice, it'll all, society will catch up. So, yeah. And in order to close in a more positive note, I want you to give me one advice that you will give to someone uh, as regards emerging tech or a life advice or whatever. Uh, one advice that you will give uh, to our audience here and online. Just one advice. It can be about emerging tech, it can be about AI, it can be about life, Tomagotchi or whatever. So. We can start from June. Sure. Um, I don't think there has ever been a more opportune time to start a business. It's never been easier with all the technologies that we talked about today, all the pain points in the world. So really try to understand uh, what is it exactly you want to do. If there is anything, there's even an inkling of you want to create value in the world, I suggest you explore it, right? I know parents might uh, frown upon you for going the riskier route and giving up a high paying job at Amazon or something like that, but listen, life's <laughs> short, right? Not to riff on you. Life, life is short, life is short, right? Uh, I know in the upcoming Gen Z generation, purpose and meaning are probably paramount. And so with things now, with technology now basically democratizing entrepreneurship, I really implore you to go explore it. And of course, if any of you are interested in just hacking around and building cool stuff uh, in a place of like-minded founders, our accelerator is always open to you. Applications are always there. You can talk to me after the panel. Great. So I got to tell my mom that first. But <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, let's have a very informative sessions, you know, through this conference, but also at the same time, let's just, let's just have fun. I mean, that's always, always my, uh, things to say. I mean, I know that we're gonna learn a lot of stuff, but let's also learn about, uh, each other's. Um, I know that, you know, technology is also a big thing, but, you know, we are the one who actually are owning the technology. So, you know, let's, you know, have fun, maybe, you know, have some drinks, you know, after the conference. Um, yeah, and just enjoy. I would say be curious, read widely, um, be enthusiastic about things. 15, 10, 15 years ago, we would have said everyone should be a coder, and now it looks like AI might wipe out the need for a lot of coders. So anyone who's pursued that path, be really good at coding if you're going to keep on that path. <laughs> uh, but the, the point is, with, in this new world, knowledge is, is power. Uh, and I think that's a really positive message because, you know, as, as I think June was making the point earlier, you've never, the world has never had more tools to access knowledge. And so it comes down to you being curious and putting the work in and you're going to have so many opportunities available to you. I was just actually thinking about the energy needed to uh, train these transformer models and wondered when someone's going to start saying that power is knowledge. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that I would say is, uh, you know, be aware of the risks, have your, eye, have your eye on the risks, but I think if you only see the risks, if you, every time there's a new technology, it, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, going back centuries, I was looking, I was doing a research for an article on um, uh, VR called the Society of the Spectacles, and I was looking at, there were people saying that spectacles were the devil's creation in the 15 and 1600s. Um, they were being manufactured in, in Venice, uh, which was where the, the major glass works were. And there were people saying that if you wore glasses, you were, you were, you were an evil person and, and the devil was basically in you. Um, uh, so there is no end of fears about technology, I would say. Um, Yes, have an eye on the risks, but also have a, an eye on what the positive things. One of the things I'm incredibly excited about, people say to me, oh, you know, will it be terrible if we're all put out of a job? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but the super rich don't seem to be struggling too hard. Um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't mind not having to work seven days a week, which I often do. Um, I, you know, I would love to have more creative time and space. And one of the things I'm really excited about is about is a zero marginal cost economy. Uh, you know, if, if I only work two days a week and I earn far less money, does it make any difference if a zero marginal economy delivers me goods and services at a price tending to zero? Um, so be aware that, that, that 
yes, there are risks, but there are also potentially profound benefits as well. And I think we, you, we can only navigate this space if we keep an, a, a positive awareness of what could be really good about this as well as, as, as well as the potential negatives. Thank you, thank you very much. A huge round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. The time has come for coffee. So we have uh, 30 minutes for uh, our break. You can find our educational corners that we have AI, we have blockchain. We are going to add also uh, creating your avatar with uh, Ioana. So see you back in uh, 30 minutes and uh, enjoy your coffee. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. an experience, it's a journey. We have four days of work. So we start with this open debate day with a lot of experts and touching sensitive themes on this information in South America. But tomorrow we have the participants, the students, participating during the entire day in a hackathon, where the group that wins the hackathon probably will visit and will share the experience within a BCN event out of Brazil so the winner group. So they are very excited to participate. It's a way to uh, engage the undergraduate students within this team. And then the experts, the network, we go to Rio. And Rio will be really exciting because we're going to visit the most important institutes, universities and places that works in the battle against uh, the misinformation. So I think it's a journey. It's a four-day journey that we prepare thinking about what can we do best to think about DCN and South America this way? So today it was very interesting. I had a chance to moderate this discussion, which brought up people from uh, South America to discuss about the challenges and to seek solutions to tackle this information. And I think it was uh, very insightful because we could hear different perspectives. And also we had students that joined the discussion. And I'm pretty sure that what we debated here opened their minds as well and also gave us lessons on how to collaborate and how to engage more to deal with this information and to have uh, democracy more uh, strengthened and um, alive. Bueno, tuvimos una gran sesión, una mañana muy interesante. Creo que es importante seguir profundizando en, en las necesidades y sobre todo esas necesidades formativas que tenemos alrededor de comprender la transformación digital y lo que las tecnologías están implicando para la, para la sociedad. Latinoamérica crece enormemente en sus capacidades de dotación, de generación de, 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 de conectividad, si se quiere, pero carece enormemente de estrategias para la utilización, para la producción, para la transformación de la información y, y de todos los datos que estamos eh, capturando. Esto pasa también por muchas deficiencias en el sistema educativo y muchas deficiencias que, que vienen tal vez articuladas a una falta de interés de, de los gobiernos o de quienes podrían eh, actuar. Creo que ese mensaje queda hoy, nos damos cuenta que vamos por un muy buen camino, que crecemos en algunos elementos, pero que el camino por recorrer sigue siendo amplio. We're so happy to be supporting this great event, bringing together specialists and students from throughout the world, not only in person, but online. Uh, the, the Digital Communication Network has done an amazing job bringing together experts on super interesting topics, really covering all aspects of this information. And the aspect I love the most was sharing all of the best practices and the projects going on throughout the region. 
Uh, it was amazing to hear from leaders from other countries in Latin America. So it's not often that we have events in Spanish, Portuguese, and English. So it was a great opportunity to bring Brazil together. La experiencia que he tenido en este evento ha sido increíble y fabulosa eh, por tres situaciones que son importantes o tres cuestiones. La primera es porque al compartir las experiencias de trabajo que tenemos sobre el derecho eh, de acceso a la información, el manejo de medios digitales y el conocer los contextos particulares, podemos ver que en los distintos países hay ideas similares. Y creo que hay gran potencial en poder trabajar en función de redes y ampliar nuestro trabajo de una manera colaborativa. Esto es muy importante para que podamos conocer y contextualizar una realidad global, que es de lo que el evento ha tratado. Creo que es eh, fabuloso lo que se ha hecho y creo que es importante que sigamos conectando y haciendo un seguimiento a las redes y cómo se pueden conformar grupos de trabajo multidisciplinario entre las instituciones y entre las organizaciones. Toda a experiência desses últimos dias foi uma experiência muito, muito rica, muito importante, não só para a universidade, né, como para os estudantes. Eles ficaram muito gratos a tudo o que aconteceu. Eu recebi uma série de mensagens de agradecimento, não só a DCN, não só a World Learning, mas também a todos os participantes, né, que eu vou transmitir para vocês depois. Mas foi um processo muito rico, de muito crescimento pessoal e profissional para esses estudantes. E em breve a gente pretende né, retribuir isso, apresentar para vocês um, um produto como resultado de todo esse processo de amadurecimento desses estudantes. Information is a systematic challenge. We need connected solutions to do. This is why it's so great to receive you guys in Brazil. Uh, global majority, global south, we do have some problems that are very specific to the region, but because this information is a systematic challenge, lots of things that work here work over there, work in a south by south collaboration or Europe uh, Brazil collaboration. So, Having the opportunity to have the connections, to share problems and to share solutions, it's a really firm step for us to create more scalable solutions to fight this information. Social media have completely changed the public debate sphere and now we have this new informational ecosystem and influencers, they are very, very important communicators. They have a very powerful uh, tool to, to reach a lot of people and uh, they have more reach than journalism in some cases uh, that, that even journalism itself has today. So we do believe there are strategic actors that need to be engaged in the fight against uh, misinformation and hate speech also online. Fact checking is the best of journalism. It is a service that helps people get the facts so they can be uh, full participant in democracy. And we can also, in second hand, uh, keep the powerful people uh, into accountable, right? So that's the first one. That's the first reason why the region really desperately needs uh, fact checking. We need to have people who understand, understands perfectly what's going on. They have the real data so they can have informed decisions and then they can pressure their, the power to actually do what is actually needed in the, in the region. Uh, secondly, I think we're kind of getting used to fact-checking, right? Uh, fact-checking has been in Latin America for at least 10 years now, 
and it's we're used to it. So every moment there is like at least a political or health uh, issue that is striking everyone. We're all we're all going to to social media and and searching for the facts because fact checkers are very common in Latin America. Then the third thing is we have to emphasize that uh, fact checking is not something that will kill this information for good. It's not the silver bullet. But it truly helps people, and it's being demonstrated. What we need to do now is take the next steps. We have to do more investigations about who disinforms, how much money it's spent in disinforming, and of course, we have to uh, start putting out recommendations for different stakeholders on what they have to do when, once there is a wave of disinformation. So basically, fact checking is the first step to keep a democracy safe and healthy. Acho que o maior desafio no combate à desinformação é fazer com que as pessoas entendam a sua responsabilidade no universo informacional. É fazer com que o cidadão possa sabe, interpretar corretamente a informação que chega até ele e atuar de uma maneira mais proativa em relação ao consumo informacional, sabendo localizar a informação, de onde ela vem, qual o propósito dessa informação e não repassando essa informação sem checar para frente. E eu acho que hoje é, o que a gente tem visto no Brasil é uma oportunidade grande de introduzir a educação midiática nos currículos escolares, para que o jovem que já nasceu nesse universo digital possa saber interpretar e desenvolver análise crítica em relação ao conteúdo mas também é, é, excedendo né, e indo para outros universos que não da escola, para a sociedade como um todo, levando a educação midiática para toda a população. Estamos em um momento especial para pensar a relação entre as pessoas e as tecnologias digitais. Porque, por um lado, a ilusão que tínhamos 20 anos atrás de que a internet ia a democratizar a sociedade parece que se perdió. Hoy estamos principalmente preocupados por las falsas noticias, por la desinformación, por la infoxicación en Internet. Pero también es cierto que hay potencialidades democratizadoras en Internet. Entonces creo que es un momento donde tenemos que plantearnos dos tareas simultáneamente. Por un lado, cómo combatir la desinformación como eh, combatir los peores efectos que Internet está teniendo en nuestra vida cotidiana que dependen del uso que hacemos de Internet hoy. Tanto quienes producen como quienes consumen y quienes producen y consumen a la vez. Pero al mismo tiempo, yo creo que tenemos que recuperar la potencialidad democrática que sigue existiendo en Internet. Democrática y democratizadora porque todos podemos decir nuestra palabra allí. Y esto permite, por ejemplo, que los ciudadanos incidan en las políticas públicas si hay voluntad política de que ello suceda, de que eso pase. E Internet tiene herramientas, podemos usar herramientas digitales para potenciar procesos de participación social mucho más democrática. En primer lugar, estoy muy agradecido a ICN por, por la participación Conocí gente increíble este, y la posibilidad de, eh, dentro de esos grupos de gente, el reco reconocer que desde diferentes eh, lugares muy heterogéneos tenemos una visión común y posibilidades de, mucha, muchas posibilidades de cooperación. Bien, en lo, en lo particular que hace a eh, mi, aport, mi, mi intento de aporte en este, en este evento, eh, generar mayor nivel de awareness en lo que es la, la convergencia entre estra comunicación estratégica y ciberseguridad y eventualmente de qué manera poder abordar esa problemática y salvaguardar a, a, a la gente, eh, eh, que todos cuenten con las herramientas este, en tanto eh, juicio, por ejemplo, generación de juicio crítico, eh, a efectos de verse menos influenciados en lo que hace a la problemática de desinformación y también este, contribuir a, un ambiente, a la generación de un ambiente de, con menor po, nivel de polución informacional. Y también eh, que adopten de manera cotidiana práct buenas prácticas en materia de ciberseguridad para protegerse de eh, posibles daños. So, this global... Uh 
organize the three three days event, an event uh, under the title Information as a Public Good. It is part of our intense um, efforts in order to underline the importance of uh, information, of fighting disinformation, but most importantly, our uh, engagement in uh, all the regions all across the world. We are more than happy of um, how these three days went. We are more than happy of the responses and the very warm welcome that we have received that has proven actually the valuable work that this and global is doing, but much more the potentials of, of these regions. DCN Americas has been launched in October 2022. DCN Global Americas will continue to thrive. Africa is going through a very profound revolution at the moment, you know, in terms of under, in terms of self pride, you know, um, and I think sometimes it's misconstrued a little bit, like when you're looking from the outside in. But Africa as a continent for a long time has kind of been under the influence of everyone else. We're the hugest consumers in the world. Everyone comes and we consume, consume, consume. But like now, Africa is at the point where it's like. We have found our identity, we're understanding our value, we're understanding who we are, and we no longer just want to consume, we want to contribute, we want to be heard, we want to build. And so I think in terms of in a geopolitical landscape, I think the world is paying attention to Africa, but I just hope that they hear, that they hear us in a way that's not through an unconscious bias. When we think about Africa and misinformation today, according to your research, and of course, geopolitical landscape. What's going on in this continent? I mean, there's China coming up with a lot of influence on one side, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a, the US and the Western world trying to, to have a part of it as well. How can you define this? Yeah, there's the, the broad trend right now is that there's a lot of incentive. There's financial incentive for misinformation for various people using bots and uh, dis uh, disinformation campaigns. And that's you see that in African elections usually, where the opposition party or the ruling party will actually pay companies to run bots, to run these kind of campaigns for them. They use their own political party money to do this. And then for foreign countries, you, the incentive for them is they want to collect UN votes. They want to get more in Africa. That's 54 countries. You know, that's a lot of UN votes of so power uh, there, you know, regarding sanctions, et cetera. So they want to do these influence campaigns. So the incentive, or and they want to control resources and access to trade. So a lot of incentive from the foreign powers. And yeah, like you mentioned, yeah, China, and of course, and the new kid on the block there is Russia with their disinformation campaign, which has exponentially uh, moved up in the past, I would say, five years. Um, they've been there for a while, um, just because their economic connection to Africa has increased in the last two decades. What is much needed in South Africa due to our history in 1994 and the hollowing out of state capture is to ensure that quality and accurate information reaches the majority of the public. And that is why it's crucial to look at public participation and access, or actually accessibility. It's very easy to talk about access, but there's a difference between access and accessibility. We have wonderful resources that is available out there basically free to use. But if you don't have reading, critical thinking skills, don't it's not there. accessible. How media literacy is important in Kenya, mainly in Kenya, uh, to, to reflect this diversity in a good way, in a very quality way, exactly. Uh, 
That's correct. Media inclusive literacy is a very important skill set for all African citizens because, uh, like you just mentioned, there is a lot of diversity in Africa, and uh, one of the key outcomes of media inclusive literacy is building intercultural dialogue so that people get to understand the differences that enrich uh, themselves through diversity. So, uh, because Africa is represented in different ways, with the middle function literacy, Africans are able to understand themselves, understand their history in a more uh, deeper manner, and then get to embrace that diversity that makes them strong and unique as Africans. The Cameroon faces experiencing uh, a lot of crises, uh, especially a security, a security crisis in the uh, Anglophone region of Cameroon. And during this uh, crisis, there were a lot of uh, disinformation, a lot of hate speech, and we uh, we took that as what uh, it is important for us to sensitize uh, the people, especially the young people, so that they can develop critical thinking about uh, the uh, uh, they are consuming information and their uh, uh, habit of uh, uh, produce information. So uh, we create Educ Media uh, as an association to, to, to make some training of people, especially the journalists, to train parents, to train young people, so they can, as I said, to develop critical thinking and to be uh, very good citizens in the digital and when they uh, consume uh, information from media. How can we report also the opportunities that, and the potential to, to help the continent to grow? So we have a number of different shows specifically looking at exactly what you're talking about, potential. So we have Marketplace Africa, and we have another show called African Voices, which is looking at innovators and people who are doing things differently. I think also when we think about journalism broadly, you know, the concept of solutions journalism is really important because it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can still tackle difficult problems, but you can also do so from the perspective of people who are making a change. What's the message for everything that you see in your life through media and technology you, you, you like to, to deliver to the people since you are a professor, you're a PhD, now you have another yeah. life? Probably you saw so many transformations and change during your life and different realities. I mean, sure. do you have a message that I think it's important to deliver in the sense of media and technology? You know, even though we have technology now, like I grew in the age of television. That's an, I'm not going to tell you my age, but we, I grew up in the age of when television was king. And now for newer generation, it is like social media and new media and so forth. My message is, honestly, regardless of what medium we're using, um, at the end of the day, people will use the medium to communicate. We're all about communicating. And at this point in time, especially for the younger generation, the world is their oyster. Um, they can, you know, you might be somewhere in this really small island, let's say in Australia or, you know, next to Australia. And you'd know so much about what's going on, let's say in Nigeria. And you, you're never going to go. You've never been there before. So my message is that um, we are really, truly a global village. We can really come to a better understanding of each other from this inter. Like mm -hmm. connection instead of seeing all the disinformation and the misinformation that we're seeing. So as people, regardless of what era you were born or what time you were born in, we are really the same. Uh, and I think we should use new media to facilitate this and to make people more aware that we're m more the same than we are different. So Ubuntu, I feel, is an ancient form of machine learning. Now, when you look at machine learning, machine learning is basically... A, a node building on top of another node and so growing and, and expanding and you get new information the node grows splits creates two new nodes etc right that's the basis very very rudimentary explanation of machine learning now ubuntu is actually considered something the same i mentioned how 
uh, the system of Ubuntu is not just, it's communal, I am because we are, but it's also building upon, right? So the young person, the old person, right, older, elder, <laughs> the elder passes on, right, knowledge, information, resources. The young person takes it, doubles it, builds on it, builds on it, shares that knowledge, right? You share it with the community, that community then shares it with the next. If you look at it, it's a very ancient system of what is now called machine learning. And even if you unpack AI, you unpack the metaverse, it is actually very African in, in, in context. You know what I mean? Um, and even just the way Africa as a hub has always been a hub of trade and very interconnected. So, um, for example, today we're in Zambia, but we have people from Uganda, uh, from Sierra Leone, from Togo, from Chad. And then we can all find intersections. We all find places that we have really, really in common and say, oh, I've got that in my culture too. I've got that in my country too. So it's in that context, you know, the same way a machine can learn multiple languages, right? Machine learning, it'll adopt multiple perspectives and then create one and give you what you look for. It's the same in the African context and how we operate as an Ubuntu system. It's actually a very refined, in my opinion, very refined form of machine learning. We just didn't have a name for it.
heard coffee instead of knowledge. So uh, in our next break, every educational corner has this kind of stickers, okay? So everyone that will go to the educational corner, it will get a sticker. It will get a green sticker. You can go even to all three corners, okay? You can even invent the fourth one. Uh, and you will learn about AI, blockchain, uh, setting up your avatar, uh, creating your MetaMask portfolio or, or whatever. And uh, you will get a sticker. And tomorrow, the ones that will have a sticker will have a QR code in order to organize a VR party with a scavenger hunt inside the metaverse, okay? And we will start with the ones that they will have a sticker uh, in order to give a prize. I didn't thought the prize yet, but I will find one really good. So uh, you will go to each corner on the breaks and you will get a sticker in order to participate to uh, the prize draw and the scavenger hunt uh, through VR. Before, before we uh, invite our first keynote speaker, of course, we are going to do something to lift up the energy, okay? Anna, can I have the song, please? You can stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. How many of you, you are more than 16, 60 years old? None. Great. So you probably know the song. Can we have the song? I am not trying to do that. When the devil came, call me Magarena. And the boy, they say, so we have a keynote about uh, Web3 revolution, pioneering trust in AI through decentralized data integrity. Ahmed Yusuf, CEO and founder of Vision Innovation US. I can call him on stage, okay? Can I have the... A huge round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. It's interesting that. Uh, oh, small case. Test. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting that the previous session was amazing and uh, people talked about diverse things and a lot of. Uh, information to digest. But what caught my attention is the one of the questions there. Somebody was asking is in one sentence to describe the uh, intersection between AI and blockchain. And that was the question with the most uh, likes, I think. Uh, because it's important for people to realize and understand there is an area of intersection but they are coming, both technologies from two different worlds. That's what we're going to find today. How are they completely different? And they completely come from, uh, they have a different needs and different uh, foundations, but at the end, they will intersect for the better of humanity. So understanding the definition of Web3, so for the, for the benefit of our audience, both in this room and around the world, to understand, just I'm going to give uh, foundational definitions of Web3, what is Web3, and what's incorporated. So 
It represents the third generation, of course, of the internet services. And that is actually utilizing um, machine-based machine, machine -based understanding of transfer of value. So I'm going to stand, stop here at the transfer of value. For the longest time, the internet that we use today, it makes us believe and think that you can only transfer information over the internet, sending your pet picture to your grandma or sending an email or sending even, in some cases, transactions, uh, bank transaction. You are just sharing information. You are sending information about what you have, a copy of what you have. So what is the, uh, the, the Web3 and the blockchain introduce us to, we can, for the first time, share value, something that of a value, value nature through the internet. That is when you send a digital art, or when you send a cryptocurrency hash, or when you send a, uh, a specific type of record, that you're actually sharing the only copy you have. And that is value, because I cannot duplicate that art I shared with you over the internet. So this is, this is significant, because the internet model was designed and built on the information sharing. And so when Google or Facebook or all this giant send you something free or give you Gmail to use or give you this information to use for free, it's actually collecting what we call a digital crumb behind you. What is digital crumbs? That every site that you visit or every place that you visit, you're leaving some trace behind. That trace is giving them power over you, information over you, a data, that at the end, what you're going to do, they're going to sell you a certain, cer certain goods that is benefiting them. But at the end, what you are, what you're walking around all over the internet, wiki walking, and at the end, you are not gaining any value. So the nature of the Web3 is decentralized and open, and it's great for users that to empower users with more control and honor over this digital crumb we, we, we leave behind. We don't want to leave digital crumbs behind without value, without getting paid for. So, and of course, there's a lot of experts in the room and they speak on the AI. We have the nature of AI is based on data, based on models that is designed and controlled by centralized entities whether it's a, a company, whether it's a there's government's project to start showing up, all of these are centralized entity. They are valuing and studying the data and putting in the models, and then they give you this uh, amazing technology and tool so you can have an answer. But the challenge is, and the problem with that, the centralized nature gives them a lot of power, a lot of controls, and a lot of uh, challenges could come from that as well. So, the reliance on the centralized data, uh, it, it could create challenges. And these challenges, we spoke, there's a lot of people who highlight uh, the, the, the ethics and the trust. And uh, I like one of the answers here, said that if you could summarize uh, this, uh, his conversation, it's one, one word, trust. This is what economy is about. The economy is about trust. This is our world is built on trust. If we don't trust Google, if we don't trust Amazon, we are not going to buy anything from it. So trust is a very important factor. But what if you can't trust AI? What if you can't do that? Why, uh, the reason you are, uh, this question is important because you, we deal with AI as it's just something given, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of data, and this data is sitting in somebody's closet or somebody's data center. So he can control your thinking, control your decision-making process, you control your outcome, whether it's an election, whether it's a scientific research, or if you rely on this specific. Today, what I'm proposing for researchers and people who are forward-thinking, the intersection of that, like it's just being discussed before the break, that between blockchain being decentralized completely and AI is being centralized completely, what can we benefit from the both world? And I think we, uh, the answer is going to be amazing that people can share information. So 
the risk of centralizing uh, centralized model that uh, we we see we see uh, data breach in, in in a lot of ways we see misuse of this data in like decision making and we see the bias in in decision this is also happening a lot around the world that there's a lot of uh, when you look at certain things there's an article in uh, Washington Post uh, recently about um, using uh, chat GPT asking specific questions about specific uh, activities I think uh, somebody asked uh, chat GPT to write a story story that has a specific nature of violence and that became uh, controversial because the result was speaking about this black neighborhood somewhere uh, in America and uh, some somebody highlighting that this is, could be a specific trained model uh, that give us this result but the the reason that this is could be a challenging in the future it could go both ways it could be, it could be even for political purpose that if you ask about somebody uh, who's not popular uh, you can think of one name like Donald Trump for example if uh, you're asking the chat GBT about what the chat GBT op opinion about somebody like that it's you're gonna have result in a different nature but you can also feel there are certain biases in this result so the lack of transparency in how these models were traced, uh, trained and how this, the data was fed to these models is actually the, the, the big question and how we can handle it, I think, is going to bring us to what we need to hear in uh, our world today, transparency on, 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 on AI. So um, the decentralization force for AI integrity and security. Another thing uh, the blockchain could bring to the AI uh, with decentralized power is to, uh, you know, across, uh, it has the nature of being spread across a lot of uh, nodes, a lot of areas, a lot of uh, data centers that could actually uh, be a powerful tool for these uh, technologies. And also the nature of immutability, immutability uh, being a ledger, and the, da the data was written once and could not be tampered with or could not be manipulated uh, for any reason, that's very important. Uh, of course, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the transparency of the blockchain is actually essential that for AI to use, that we needed an area where uh, we can understand how the, the models were created and was, um, you know, uh, uh, trained and also what data was fed to these models. And that is very hard right now because you have a, the, 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 benef the benefit factor, you have the, um, you know, the, the, the economical factor. Most of these AI companies, they are trying to do controlling uh, the, the outcome controlling the economical benefit from it so they can keep increasing their value. But at the same time, being transparent, uh, it will bring a lot of value for the good of the people. So the decentralized force is still uh, the contribution of blockchain to AI uh, will bring the data integrity for blockchain to ensure that the AI systems trained on data that is accurate. The accuracy also is very important. Those who deal with the, um, you know, the blockchain and deal with uh, using of uh, the data uh, of blockchain, it, it has that nature. As they say, follow the money. Uh, there is challenges in the economic and the hype of the money that blockchain has uh, brought to our world, but at the same time, it has a huge success because people are not going to put their money if there's a system is not trustworthy. So creating that trust have give us confidence that the system is successful. Maybe there is a lot of greed, there is a lot of things behind this success, but at the same time, that is proven for over uh, 10, 15 years, this is a very secure system, this is a very trustworthy system that we can rely on in a very critical data in real time. And uh, so, 
uh, will remove, as, as I mentioned, the bias, because this is, this is also something that's very important to understand, to, 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 to rely on the decisions and the intelligence thinking of AI. We need to be able to uh, feel that there's no biases involved in one way or the other. If we're just dealing with uh, a system that will give us a very uh, accurate information and very accurate results. And finally, um, uh, enhancing the cybersecurity. Between the two technologies, there is something very unique. Each one has a unique value. So for example, AI is great at detection, early detection, things that uh, before it's happened, we can use the block, uh, AI to detect this information. But at the same time, to ex uh, expand and uh, scale and have this, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the detection being dealt with in ahead of time, you need technologies like the blockchain. For example, if there is systems and intersection between the two uh, technologies before COVID-19, and we had the way that we can detect what happened in uh, COVID-19. We knew it, we knew it before it happened. The blockchain would have given us, us a way in how to deal, how to build a protocol ahead of time. That protocol could have created a, a safer world that could save a lot of people's life because we are detecting ahead of time. But a lot of people, a lot of governments dealt with the situation after it happened. They did not have any way to uh, detect anything before it happened. So this is a, propo uh, a proposition for using the AI to detect and using uh, uh, blockchain to uh, for 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 the for using blockchain to have a way to solve the issue that is being detected. So the applications that uh, in Web3 that could enhance uh, the AI, they are massive. There is a lot of opportunities there. There's a lot of uh, uh, research area that is being done. One, uh, just to highlight uh, quick, it's a marketplace to decentralize uh, the AI. For example, platform like SingularityNet uh, allow for, buyer, for buying and selling of AI services in, in a very uh, open and decentralized way. And also management, project like Cortex, deep brain chain, uh, use AI to optimize blockchain operation and uh, tokenomics as well, and predictive analysis in finance. This is also an area of uh, a lot of benefit for people who are worrying about the uh, how to 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 to, the, to expect what to expect in the finance market, the, uh, things and how to strategize in investment and things like this. So now we have the for the cybersecurity uh, blockchain securing data pipeline that is, is, is very important because as long as, also it mentioned in the, in the previous session, that it's all about how this data is valid. The data will be invalid as soon as it's been breached or it's been, uh, you know, hacked. So at the end, if you are using blockchain and you are understanding that this data is secure, this data is not being messed with or dealt with, you will give you, giving you a lot of confidence. And the, you want it also not to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy worrying about where is this going to go. So at the end, if you have a spread uh, nodes and areas of intersections uh, sharing, uh, you know, the same amount of, the same data with multiple nodes that it cannot be, uh, you know, tampered with, could not be changed, is stolen, you have the ability to create a massive amount of trust. And also, uh, the access control. Blockchain enables this, enable, uh, you know, having people from different parts of the world could share the same amount of information at the same time. So the detection in, 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 in AI is very important because, as I mentioned earlier, for, for COVID case, it's very important 
to understand that the early detection in every challenge is key for this technology. Early detection of health risk, early detection of uh, conflict maybe around the world, early detection of supply chain uh, challenges that might happen, early detection of safety issue in aviation and things like that. This is very important because it will create a safer world, it creates a resilient world that we can actually deal with a lot of problem in a timely manner. So, uh, and this, uh, the AI has that capability and also uh, will help, uh, you know, uh, proactively secure, creating secure measure by recognizing these early indicators, uh, you know, triggering uh, proactive security protocols in place that before human intervention or even without any human intervention. So uh, combining these two technologies will enhance the data integrity on AI because we know now for sure, uh, let's say two or three years from now, we know that the data has been in the blockchain for a long time, nobody changed it, everybody's sharing the same source of information, um, distributed for security reasons. And now we just have to enhance the models that actually working behind these, uh, uh, you know, data or in front of this data so we can have a better result. So now we, for the use cases that could actually benefit we, we, from the, the best from the two worlds, the world of AI, the world of blockchain, we have health care. Uh, patient data management. This is, it could be a good use cases and actually there is actually uh, researches and uh, some sort of experimental uh, technologies there uh, on projects like the MIT project and also there's, uh, the benefit is enhancing patient privacy and improve data accuracy and allow for earlier detection of disease. This is very important. Now we're dealing with, we are in the year 2024, we're still dealing with risk of cancers every day. Almost everybody in the world has some family mem member that is suffering or suffered from uh, cancers. So this is very important. I have talked to researchers. They have been doing a lot of studying in this area by just, without even creating anything new, just studying the data and having this data trained in a way that you can detect certain behaviors, certain patterns, and certain people, certain uh, lifestyles, that you can come up with a good result, this could help save lives in a very short term without too much work. So um, fraud in the finance system is something very big that a lot of people are also uh, deal with every day around the world that we can, uh, you know, there is a use cases in this area, like the platform for a, uh, IBM, Watson, uh, integrated with blockchain to provide more robust financial risk analysis tool. And the outcome reduce uh, the fraud activities and enhancing the transaction security. And this is, of course, uh, something that's been done. And uh, supply chain also is a, a uh, very important challenge that the, 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 the world is facing today, what happened uh, when there is conflict, when there's worlds in certain key areas in the world, the, the first thing will suffer is the supply chain. Uh, we already have some challenges, for example, in the last couple of months, what happening in the Middle East that created a challenge on the supply chain, uh, and what if, these things is bigger than what we see today. How can we prevent this? How can we uh, detect this? And how can we create uh, a solution? And the case of Walmart is actually very unique. It's actually studying the supply chain and tra tracing if there is any issue with any kind of uh, products, where it comes from, if there's disease, or if there is any kind of uh, viruses or anything, how to cut off this chain before it became a community pandemic or a challenge in the uh, community. So rather than destroying the entire shelves, entire product line, everywhere we just trace it and to the specific location and have dealing with before losing a lot of money. Uh, and, and the impact is 
be significantly reduce the risk of the contamination in, in a certain area. So, and, and uh, we already uh, uh, said this many times, we have um, the challenge of blockchain the real world in, in, in case studies we have the security, cybersecurity, this is actually an area that I'm interested in personally, that how could we, this is the first step and the obvious step, using blockchain and AI to reduce the cybersecurity risk around the world. Because as we use technologies every day, we're creating a lot of data. And this data at the end, it will become very vulnerable to attacks, very uh, vulnerable to a lot of challenges. So the more we bringing these two technologies together, the better results we're gonna have at the end of the day. So for the implementation, we have the poly uh, swarms, uh, a decentralized threat intelligence community using blockchain to facilitate the micro engagement between the security experts and the A AI uh, engine. And the, advant uh, the advantage, more accurate threat detection. This is, cannot uh, repeat this more and more enough because this is where the two could benefit and uh, providing a better result. And so there's a lot of challenges. I keep mentioning these challenges uh, in uh, different ways, but the, the idea of, uh, there is already a lot of uh, agencies working in a, a lot of vendors working in the AI and blockchain uh, that could actually benefit and reducing all the challenges I mentioned from the data risk, from the challenges of the uh, technology and the challenges of uh, the data shared and data breach and also the trust, the trust and mistransparency. Uh, so from the technical challenge we have the for both of them, we have the uh, scalability issue for both AI and blockchain. This is this is also a challenge, but uh, hopefully, the more need, that we better creating a solution for this. And complexity uh, in integration, this is another challenge. And then we have the ethical. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about that. The biases, the fairness, the data privacy, uh, another area. Uh, then do we have the government where they how to regulate the need for new framework for regulations, how to regulate the both worlds. We are not just looking at their hype, so we're looking at the challenge, but regulated actually for the benefit. So the government has a major role to play rather than just shutting down and saying we can't deal with any of it. Uh, and then putting a standard for the international uh, standard that we can benefit from. So at the end, as I mentioned, we have the challenge, we have the solution. But what we are don't have is like people who can sit down and bring these solutions. So the call for action is, as we face this global challenge uh, of pa the pandemic and the recent uh, supply chain disruption and the conflict that we waking up every day for a new conflict and the climate change, the integration of blockchain and artificial offer our artificial intelligence offer a powerful solution. Blockchain provide uh, unmatched transparency while AI can create precision and early detection through data analytics. Together, they can help us address the issue uh, impartially and without centralized control, particularly in critical areas like elections, healthcare, so we don't want to hear from the next guy coming saying the election was hacked. This technology pairing can restore trust in our institution by delivering clear and biased results. It's time for us to embrace these tools to enhance decision making and, tra and tackle our most uh, pressing issues. Let's act now to secure future where technology drives democracy and global well-being. That's not the end. The end is the future of decentralized, because I'm a believer in decentralized will helping the, de the decision making. So 
in the ever-evolving econ economy, the landscape, the future, belong to those who embrace decentralization and innovate by harnessing the boundless potential of blockchain technology. So the take-home message for those who are interested, researcher and um, you know, developers and you know, investors, having blockchain technology is very important. My book is coming up in, uh, in, Janu in June. It's going to highlight these specific areas of challenge with the perspective of what if there's a, another pandemic gonna come? How can we detect it now? How can we prepare? Especially in the, uh, the, the area of technology, the area of the cyber pandemic. How can we deal with this? With that, I leave you. Thank you very much. And hopefully that you enjoy your, the rest of the conference. Thank you, thank you very much. We have time for one question. Do we have any lucky ones that want uh, one question? Anyone? Okay, I see hands. Uh, thank you for thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, when when we talk about AI and blockchain, these two is actually uh, yeah they coincide. But when I when I was thinking about it, in a sense of countries implementing both of that, the major problem is operational cost for for doing AI and blockchain. Because for example, AI you need a data set for that, uh, probably one server. And then if you want to decentralize that, you have to have uh, six of that or three in other provinces in like in Philippines. So so how how will you approach that to our to like policymakers or you know shareholders that is interested in AI and blockchain for the operational cost. If they're like you know the road major roadblock is operational cost. So if I if I could summarize the questions in uh, to put it very uh, specifically that the cost of blockchain and the cost of um, AI, is that going to create a lot of headache for decision makers? Is it going to be massive expenses? Uh, my answer to that, I think, f it's gonna take two perspectives. One, yes, this new technology is gonna be costly, costly uh, by bringing a lot of, uh, you know, new tools and new researchers and operational costs from maintenance perspective in the short run. In the long run, you're gonna prevent a lot of challenges security. For example, one of them, early detection of a lot of issues that you could have uh, you know, faced and paying billions of dollars to prevent a small issue. That's one take. The other take is actually, this technology could actually pay by itself if you allow the right thinking, the right people, if, you, if, 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 if a government tried to think of this as a way that to diversify their economy, opening it for different researchers, opening it for different investors to come to their countries, or even the people in the country, could create a lot of momentum and actually, in the long run, will b bring economical benefit. But that's not only the, 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 the only way to reduce the operational cost. Uh, experiment. There's a lot of people in the technology world that are ambitious and they are eager to come and work with government so they can create these kind of uh, solutions. So at the end, just like any other technology, it started from smart people like yourself uh, and like these people in the room sitting in their garage building something. Then the enterprise level will happen, then big companies will come and invest because they invested, they would like to come and invest those kind of, in these ideas. And then government has to build a framework. They don't have to worry about, well, actually I have to spend billions of dollars, so I'm just gonna shut down this project. It's not gonna work like that. If they are, they think in a strategy, in a strategy way that they implement first, uh, they, they, they attract ideas first, and then they implement 
later all their job is just to put framework and regulation in place that will allow for this advancement to happen, they're going to benefit uh, greatly from that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Do we have one more? Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, thank you for your lovely presentation with uh, very interesting information. I'm currently doing uh, research on um, discovering the linkage between a strong data protection rights and AI safety. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on uh, the EU AI safety act that recently passed the European Parliament recently? Do you think it's the right way to um, regulate AI to for its sustainable growth moving forward? Thank you. Thank you, this is a very good question. But the simple answer to, to this question is um, using decentralized way to solve the, the centralized issue. So the decentralization of AI, I think the solution for both, the solution for what, how to take blockchain to the next level and how to solve and take AI to the next level. But decentralizing it, uh, this is going to be the solution from security perspective, from integrity perspective, transparency, transparency, all of the above. Because as soon as you decentralize, you have more than one person, more, more than one brain, more than one entity controlling the data and dealing with the, the risk of what's going to come from this data. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. A huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. One last thing as regards the EU AI Act, because I was one of the 36 people working on that thing. Uh, the approach is a really conservative approach as regards the regulation. So uh, what the EU did uh, had a pyramid of risk, and they say, OK, let's as assign risks to that pyramid in order to understand risk. It's not a super forward thinking regulation, but it's a start in order to understand the implications. So uh, all the approach was a risk-based approach. It's a regulatory approach that uh, is a worldwide thing. But uh, from our perspective, it's a start. So uh, the next panel is about all the ethical challenges and uh, everything. Uh, let me uh, read the names wrong, okay? Uh, so, we have Cassandra Tomasios. You will introduce yourselves with the proper names. Here you can come on stage. Larissa and Luis and Ling Wang. Make yourself comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Do you like it with the, f the lights? Or should I turn it off? Yeah. Better pictures. So, uh, the title of the panel is AI and Accountability the legal challenges in the age of intelligence machines. I didn't thought of myself, and AI did, uh, but we can start uh, with introductions. Uh, we can start from, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hello, hello. Hi, hi everyone, my name is Larissa. I am a lawyer in Malaysia. I work in the human rights space, and I have a company called Hakita where at the forefront we empower anyone and everyone on their basic human rights. And so happened this month we are covering on AI, uh, the impacts of it internationally, uh, nationally. And the bigger picture of Hakita is to fund pro bono cases uh, for access of justice in the human rights sphere. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so similar to Larissa, my name is Cassandra. I'm from Malaysia as well. Um, surprise, surprise, we're all lawyers sitting up here. Um, 
So I actually work from, uh, I work in a law firm called Mao Wing Kwai and Associates and we do corporate work. We have a technology team as well at the firm where we draft terms and conditions for AI platforms in Malaysia. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Li Ying, I'm from Taiwan. Uh, a big fan of Web3 and a lawyer too. <laughs> Um, I haven't been practicing law for 18 years, including the, uh, the past eight years uh, running this law firm called Nexus, Nexus uh, with the support of efforts, uh, which is a uh, very good uh, startup communities of uh, more than a thousand founders uh, from uh, around the globe and also uh, in this um, neighboring region in particular. Actually, June has shared a bit about efforts. Um, uh, we'd like to share more if you're interested. So um, we're proud of our community, not, not only because of uh, the business success of the startups, but also because many of them are uh, like creating tools to empower people uh, for the better uh, by using te technologies. So, uh, um, so if I may, <laughs> I would like to share more about what I've learned from the founders. And leave the you know the, the difficult part of <laughs> the the discussions, the legal talk, to my fellow panelists. Great. So uh, I will start with uh, a very let's say open question: uh, Shall we uh, wait from AI to read the terms and conditions in order not to do the apocalypse? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, so uh, from your perspective. What are the current ethical challenges uh, in, uh, from the legal perspective, from the jurisdiction perspective? Because we all know that uh, as regards AI and as regards blockchain, everything comes to a jurisdiction. We, are, we have different jurisdictions, we have different laws, each country has a different sovereign identity, so uh, there are different perspectives. Uh, and I want to hear your perspective as regards the challenges in this region and how you see it aligned with the global. And of course, then we can go uh, to see how people from uh, your communities see it. So, yeah. okay. So they always say don't give a lawyer a mic because they don't know when to stop talking. But let's go. So I will start with actually a case law. It's quite interesting on the right to privacy and data. I think that would be the most important issue when it comes to AI because AI is driven by data and what are the rights when it comes to data. So in a case in US in 2020 called Gen X versus International Business Machines, IBM, uh, the plaintiff was a photographer who uploaded a bunch of pictures from a political rally to this site called Flickr. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, um, but it's a site where you can upload pictures. So what happened is he alleged that Flickr's former parent company used these images to create a database of 99 million images for use as a reference library to train AI models. Now, with this database, IBM coded a subset of the photos to describe appearances of people in the photos and offered its collection to researchers to reduce bias in facial recognition models. Now, obviously, IBM had very good intentions here because they wanted to avoid discrimination and bias when it came to this. However, the case, uh, IBM faced potential liability under the law that is available in uh, US on the Biometric Information Act. So that was one of the main issues there. What do we do with the data that we get via AI? Now, because I come from Malaysia, so I will cover a little bit on the ASEAN side. So in, in Malaysia, there was, sorry, in ASEAN, there was an ASEAN framework on personal data protection that was adopted in 2016. Now this framework is of course not binding, it's just uh, uh, something that guides the ASEAN countries when it comes to personal data. Now, when you go one step further, so there is this framework for the ASEAN countries. Only five countries out of these ASEAN countries actually have laws specifically to personal data. Now, why it's important to have that next stage of law, which is personal data, is because if we don't have that level of personal data law, how will we know when AI is actually infringing 
these laws. So out of the uh, ASEAN members, only five countries has this. And uh, Singapore is actually at the forefront here. Together with Thailand, they released the Model AI Governance Framework in 2019. Uh, and launched the AI governance testing framework and toolkit in 2022. And Thailand did the same with a AI ethics guideline in 2019 to help the government agencies on what to do with the data. And in 2023, adopted the Thailand Artificial Intelligence Guidelines to help private sectors develop AI. So again, these guidelines are not law. They are primarily focused on principle and ethics. So the main issue that we face now is there is no law. And lawyers, we like definition. Because without definition, we don't know what falls in a framework and what falls outside. There's literal interpretation, there's broad interpretation. So that would be one of the main issues that uh, I see from this uh, AI. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, I think stemming from Larissa, I'm going to take it in two folds. So there's actually two things which I think we need to look at. One is um, the legal challenges for AI perspectives when it comes to liability and accountability. But if we take that one step further, we also have legal challenges within the legal fraternity. Um, and that includes judges uh, and lawyers using AI in the form of either ChatGPT or any other AI platforms that are starting to be used in their day-to-day -day work. So these, I mean, they're twofold essentially. One is the AI challenges which we see for um, predominantly everyone is liability and accountability. Um, and one of those that we see very clearly is, I don't know if there's anyone from Canada here. Is there anyone from Canada here? No, okay, great. Next time. Um, <laughs> Um, so it, in, in Canada, actually, there's a case, it was an Air Canada case, and don't know if any of you have heard of it. So Air Canada used to use a chat box, which is an AI-generated chat box on their online website. And what happened was there was a passenger who couldn't fly because of a bereavement issue. So his mother had passed away, and he tried to have a cancellation of his flight, and then he you know, went onto the website, chatted with the AI chat box, and said, okay, well, I'd like to cancel my flight ticket. Um, but in return, I would either like a refund, and I understand that you have something called a bereavement fee, which you can you know, pay me back with. And the AI chatbot goes, yes, we do. We provide a certain percentage of a bereavement fee based on your ticket fare, blah, blah, blah. And he went, okay, well, that's all great and fine. But when he actually came down to it, Air Canada turned, you know, turned around and said, no, we're not giving you any bereavement fee. It's not part of our terms and condition. We didn't agree to this. And he turns around and he said, well, I took a snapshot of what your AI said to me in the form of a chat. So that went all the way up to the case in the high court and the tribunal when they turned around and they said, well, actually, Air Canada is liable. No doubt it wasn't in the millions, a couple of hundred dollars. Um, but the payment that they had to pay in terms of damages was one, to refund the flight ticket, and two, to pay damages because essentially whatever content there's you know, on the website, regardless of whether they were talking to a natural person or an AI chat box on the website, still part of your website, still representing you as a company, um, and as far as they were concerned, Air Canada was fully liable. So this is an example as well also, I think there was a question previously for the previous panel where um, are AI responsible um, in terms of liability and accountability? Well, the answer is no, because legally speaking, they're not natural persons. But the problem with this is you have a lot of information that's on websites, especially AI platforms, where liability and accountability is an issue. An example was where someone was essentially being bullied and he goes onto his laptop, uh, something similar to ChatGPT, and he says, you know, what do I need to do? This is how I'm feeling. And there was a lack of emotion, obviously, when AI is responding to things like this. And so the information which the AI gave him, in a nutshell and in a long story short, resulted in obviously suicidal attempts and things like that. So the question is, you know, legally speaking, is that AI an independent person? No, it's not a natural person. So this is where the gray areas and the perimeters lie. But each country um, at the moment now fail to have an all-encompassing AI regulatory framework, which includes everything. So it's, it's rather fragmented, and that's the legal challenges which governments have. Um, essentially consolidating everything. We've got personal data, we've got you know, 
data protection, we've got privacy rights, we've got intellectual properties, we've got liability, we've got accountability, and we have separate frameworks. We've got your criminal civil procedures for different countries. You have intellectual properties, trademarks, patents, copyrights. You have personal data protection, but we don't have anything to consolidate all of these statutory legal requirements into one framework to address AI. Um, so I think that's the issue that we're having now. Sorry, I think a lot Wait. longer than I expected. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Well, um, <laughs> to um, zoom out a little bit uh, in response to the question, um, in terms of um, the global application of technologies versus uh, the jurisdiction-specific law enforcement, uh, I actually feel quite resonant with what uh, Yusuf just shared, <laughs> the idea of uh, centralization versus decentralization that also applies to uh, the law area. Exactly. Um, so taking the idea of DAO as an example, DAO, <laughs> Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which is, um, uh, an, a, a rather democratic alternative to decentralized uh, corporate, corporate governance. Uh, people uh, in the blockchain area talk a lot about this topic, uh, wanting to like tackle the issues uh, many speakers uh, shared in common uh, about like uh, the AI transparency, the AI bias, and ethics, all that. Uh, we recently did a research uh, for the government uh, to, uh, uh, to study the DAO LLC structures proposed by Wyoming and uh, many other jurisdictions. Uh, and, and compare that with um, uh, the DAO model law proposed by a civic tech community. And as you can imagine, uh, the DAO LLC structure is more like a, a, a top-down uh, initiative uh, requiring uh, the organizations to still register with the state government and then uh, face the same issue, the, the same inherent issues that, you know, the jurisdiction specific uh, corporate registrations um, uh, would face. Uh, but the DAO model law uh, takes uh, a rather bottom-up approach. Uh, it encourages the governments and, and uh, the communities to like work together and negotiate the differences so people can like it, within different jurisdictions they can um, uh, brainstorm together and um, uh, in the hope that the uh, the law would eventually align so I think eventually I think I uh, right I think uh, the down model law makes better sense because it embraces the spirit of web3 uh, like we don't just try to neutralize everything uh, from the centralized point of view. Agree? Agree, yeah. <laughs> cool. So, uh, before we go to uh, our next round of questions, uh, I have a question for the audience through Slido. Okay. Uh, it's, what is your biggest fear about emerging technologies? Because we are speaking about ethics, we're speaking about fears, so I want to create a, a fear, a cloud fear, in order to uh, try to erase it altogether by uh, almost uh, trying to reply to all the concerns. So uh, until we have the cloud, uh, let's start with your uh, case. And of course, we found out that if you want a free ticket, you can go and chat w and convince a, a chatbot from an airline to give you one. So try that. Uh, what is your biggest uh, fear or your biggest concern from uh, a legal perspective? Yeah. Um, so I come from the human rights perspective. So I think that would be the biggest fear uh, for me, only because for example, in the ASEAN countries, right, we are talking about access to justice. And AI is amazing. We have seen what AI can do for people, how it simplifies things for people like us. 
co uh, consolidating data, case studies together, or finance issues, education. But I think we are missing one point. It's the step before that. The poor, the people who can't reach this access to justice, they don't even have access to laptops or technology. How do we close that gap of knowing what is out there when they don't even have the tools to start that process? So uh, access, uh, just to tie it again to human rights, so one of the speakers spoke uh, earlier about the bias and discrimination issue. That is also a very big issue when it comes to human rights because if all the data is consolidated on a white person or a black person or the poor or the women or the marginalised community, then that is the data that will follow through and create that legacy instead of stopping it. And uh, aside from discrimination, it's the point of uh, right to equality that would tie with, in Malaysia, we had a case of uh, an AI system being used for sentencing on a drug uh, act case. So the, the defendant did appeal that decision saying that the AI system cannot sentence on behalf of a judge. And he quoted fundamental liberties in our federal constitution, Article 5, which is the right to life, and Article 8, right to equality. But the appeal eventually was allowed. They gave a lower sentencing, but the judge did not speak on the fundamental, fundamental liberty point. So that would be my greatest concern, the human rights uh, interlink with AI. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to say whatever she said, really, because she pretty much covered everything. <laughs> you, you can say the second uh, concern. I don't think you have only one. So, <laughs> so yeah, okay. So I think um, Dimitri's right. The second yeah. thing that probably comes up is lack of accountability. Um, stemming from access to justice, if we can imagine a world with AI where people aren't able, well, that, that's our jobs, right? As lawyers, we assist clients to sue other people in the interest of justice and to access justice, both on a civil, corporate, and a criminal level. So imagine a world of AI where there are so many jurisdictional cross-border issues, um, whether it is in China or Malaysia or the US or the UK. And if we don't have any links or connections, because that's an issue that we're moving on to now in terms of accountability with smart contracts, um, there is no concrete jurisdictional and dispute resolution space, especially when it comes to data that is on AI platforms where we don't know where the source, we don't know where the location is, we don't know where that information is coming from. So a lack of accountability is going to be a huge problem when it comes to trying to pinpoint where exactly that justice is and essentially to be put very straightforward, who are we going to sue? Um, I think maybe as legal practitioners, that's something which would be, you know, a grave concern for me. <laughs> uh, that, that's a difficult one because uh, I'm, I'm fearless. <laughs> I'm super optimistic um, uh, in terms of Web3. Um, I can explain. <laughs> so the um, uh, reason why I feel so fascinated about the idea of Web3 is actually... Um, I learned from the founders uh, how exactly how powerful AI and generative AI would be, and how the blockchain based the blockchain based smart contract uh, would be able to um, uh, rebalance the power. So, um, well, when I first heard this uh, term smart contract back in 2018, I was a bit annoyed. <laughs> like I was like, uh, how dare you developers, you know, uh, <laughs> claim that the, the contract you write are uh, smart. Um, isn't it the, the lawyer's job? <laughs> um, but um, I had to admit, uh, 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 no matter how perfect uh, the contract, the lawyer's contract is, it is there for people to breach, right? Either the seller or the buyer. And then, um, well, the, the lawyer get to um, work more and uh, be paid more in the court to <laughs> solve the problems they originally created. But jokes, jokes aside, um, uh, one of the amazing features of a smart contract is that it is um, automatically executable, uh, meaning that uh, the smart contract actually uh, allows no one to breach the contract. And uh, the potential use cases include, um, like, number one, uh, decentralized ID for us individuals. 
this might be used to um, address the concerns of like uh, many of our speakers also um, brought up earlier, uh, the um, scams and the um, uh, impersonation, all that issues. And uh, number two, the idea of decentralized ID can use also apply to uh, data and content. So on the one hand, it may be used to tackle the issues of disinformation, and on the other hand, um, it also can be utilized to like um, uh, honor the uh, content creators to um, make sure the uh, uh, distribution of rewards, royalties, uh, fairly and um, efficiently. And uh, also number three, the, uh, the idea of DAO that we just mentioned, it kind of de democratized uh, decentralized corporate uh, governance. So, um, mm, uh, yeah, like Sherman just shared with me during the coffee break, um, uh, so uh, about how he, you know, works with the government. He said that um, secret sauce is to hack. So what I learned from uh, the founders is this also hack everything. So I do believe like Web3 is the uh, new way that we hack to address all the uh, issues created uh, from Web1 and Web2. Okay, great. So let's go to the word cloud. Uh, when you can see it's deep fakes, data privacy, fake news. When you see that big, you know that you are in a DCN conference, okay? so. Uh, but we see also things that we cannot uh, win, like stupidity, uh, lack of empathy, no awareness, uh, losing access, uh, left behind, uh, vulnerabilities. Okay, uh, in order to close it not in uh, this kind of uh, doom and gloom, I want you to give in one sentence or uh, two uh, what are you from your perspective, from a legal perspective, from your personal perspective, you are positive about new technologies? What type of things do you think uh, that it will change to your profession uh, in a positive way? Okay? In a positive way. <laughs> I'm just going to quote this one uh, by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. I love what he said. He said, to be a to be effective, to be humane, to put people at the heart of development of new technologies, any solution, any regulation must be grounded in respect for human rights. I love that. So before we look on how to make things easier, we need to remember we are also helping ourselves as humans on how to be better. So I think this is wonderful. We are all from different uh, areas that we can work together, come up with a framework, work with our governments, and I think AI can bring more positivity than negativity. Yeah. Okay, great. I think um, Larissa's right to put that into context though. Uh, a more positive environment for AI would revolve around good governance when it comes to regulatory frameworks. Um, and, but that can only be done when actors from both governmental regulatory compliance bodies and people who are actually in the tech industry, which include your developers and people actually doing the groundwork for AI, have conversations and have decision-making processes which are combined in order to achieve the positive environment that we need for AI to be sustainable in the future. Well, I think it is, it is important <laughs> to keep in mind that um, we do have choices, and which is why we are all here to brainstorm you know, for the better future. Great, thank you, thank you very much. A huge round of applause for our panel. And now we have a great announcement, lunch, okay. <laughs> so we have uh, until uh, I think is 1.30. Uh, so uh, from the logistic perspective, we go downstairs to the restaurant, okay? You will see the signs there. And uh, we have almost an hour because you are using the elevators, uh, calculate five minutes to wait to the elevator for the others. So, yeah, go to the elevators earlier uh, and be on time at 1.30. And of course, if you have time, and you must make time, to go also to the 
corners in order to get some stickers and learn new things. A huge round of applause to you and have a nice lunch.
Great, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a very, we have a plenty of space. We have plenty of space. Come, come, come. You can also sit in the ground like a sports team. Okay? Great. Are you okay? Shall I lie down 100%? Do you want me like this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're not okay. <laughs> Vlad, we are waiting you. I'm <laughs> you can lie down with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Standing on the shoulder of the exactly. <laughs> Everyone says DCN. DCN. Once again. One, two, three. DCN. Let's say blockchain or Bitcoin or whatever. <laughs> DCN. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Now that you are famous through the photo, I want you to sit down and give a huge round of applause to our next keynote speaker, Michael Osei Gassi, right? Super. Blockchain verification, ensuring trust in a decentralized world and the role of digital influencers. Thank you, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, my name is Michael Osejesi, and then I'm a law student and also the executive director for Ignite Youth Ghana. So my mission here is very simple. Okay, I'm going to talk about the topic blockchain verification, ensuring trust in a decentralized world the role of digital influencers. So my predecessors, or the earlier speakers, has already said something about blockchain verification. But I'm going to make it more practical, right? I'm going to make it more practical so that if you are here and then you are a tech enthused, you appreciate what we are doing, or you are a curious beginner too, you also appreciate what we are going to do here. So like I said, I'm going to make it more practical, okay, to break it down so that maybe we all can be able to grasp something and then understand the whole show, even before I go to the slides. All right, so um, I want us to play a whisper game, right? So can I have about four people joining me here? Four people. Four people, maybe one, two, three, four. <laughs> one, two, three, four. <clears throat> four people. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you learn up here. <laughs> yes, so we are going to play a whisper game, right? So I'm going to whisper something into her ears, and then she will transfer it to this person, to her, to it reaches the last person, right? <laughs> yeah. 
All right. So what did she say? Um, she said, uh, this in global is the best thing that happened to my life. <laughs> All right. So what did he say? He said, DC and global is the best thing that has happened to my life. There's too many. DC and global is the best thing that happened to my life. Uh, I think you said DC and global is the best thing that ever happened in my life. Uh, All right. So thank you. So let's give them an applaud. <laughs> All right. So you can have a seat. <laughs> yes. So we realize that when I pass the information to the first person before getting to the last person, some vital part of the information has been distorted, right? So let's say, for instance, we are sitting in this room. We are playing that kind of whisper game. And I want to deliver an information to the first person to reach out to the last person. Of course, by the time the information reaches the last person, some vital part may have been distorted, right? And then it may be such that even the, the very message that I want to convey, I may not get it as I want. So how do we then get an information from the first person to reach the last person without the information being distorted? And that is the essence of blockchain technology. So <coughs> a blockchain technology is like a digital diary that is shared among a group of people. And this diary that is shared among the group of people, everybody in the group can be able to make an entry. But one thing is that once an entry is made, that entry cannot be changed or it cannot be altered and it cannot be tempered rate. And once an entry is also made, it becomes visible for the other people who are part of the group. I don't know if you, if you get it. Once an entry is made, it becomes visible to the other people who are also members of the group, and that entry cannot be changed. So the digital diary is not stored in a single place like a library, and it's also not stored on a single computer. Instead, it is distributed across multiples of computers all over the world. Another scenario is like, let's say for instance, we all sitting in this room, right? We want to start a book club. So for us to start a book club, we need to have something like a shared document. A shared document, that's, I mean, with a shared document, we get to know who has which book. So I may have Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. He may have um, As a Man Thinker by James Allen. And then Dimitris may have the seven habits of highly effective people by Steve Convey, right? So with a shared document, you know the book I have, we know the book he has, and we know the book that Dimitris also has. So anytime the book exchanges hands, the person who takes the book and the person who also receives the books makes an entry. So in that situation, we already have a situation whereby someone can come and tell us that, hey, I mean, I didn't receive this book or I didn't give this book out. Because any time an entry is made, it becomes visible for all of us or everyone in the group to see. I mean, do you appreciate it to this, this extent? All right, so let's, 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 let's get to the slides. Sorry. Yes, so before the slides come, so the, the book club that I just talked about can be something like a financial transaction that, I mean, a group of people enter into, right? And then the book can be anything of value. So talking about anything of value, I'm talking about both tangible and then intangible assets, right? So with tangible assets, we are talking about something like a land, a building, or something that we can touch. And then, thank you very much. With the intangible asset, we are talking about something like intellectual property. And intellectual property, we are looking at patent, copyright, or a trademark. So virtually anything of value can be traded and can be tracked on a blockchain, right? So let's get to the slice. So a blockchain platform is a shared digital ledger that allows users to record transactions and share information securely. A distributed network of computers maintains the register, and each transaction is verified by consensus among the network participants. Of course, I mean, just as we just played the RISPR game, you know, by the time the information reached the last person, the information was distorted, right? So with blockchain, we are able to share information securely. 
without information being tempered. Blockchain is a shared immutable ledger that facilitates the process of recording transactions and tracking assets in a business network. An asset can be tangible, a house, a car, cash, or land, or intangible, which is intellectual property, patent, copyright, or branding. Virtually anything of value can be tracked and traded on a blockchain network, reducing risks and cutting costs for all that are involved. Business runs on information, and the accurate the information, and the faster we receive the information, the more we have business efficacy. So blockchain helps to deliver this information securely. It helps to de deliver this information securely because it is immutable, it is unchangeable, and then it is decentralized, right? So blockchain is not like the centralized system whereby we have the government or the bank controlling the whole thing. But with blockchain, it is decentralized because it is shared across multiple computers all over the world. So importance of trust in a, in a decentralized ecosystems. So let us talk about the importance of trust. Let us imagine a world where everyone trusts everyone, okay? We can have a hardworking mother who lives in Dubai who can send money to the award in Thailand without the award needing a bank account. We can also have a situation whereby election fraud becomes a thing of the past, whereby citizens can have absolute trust in election processes. We can also have a situation whereby an aid organization or an NGO that helps poor people receiving money from individual donors and then distributing this money efficiently and effectively to the beneficiaries with they proving their identity without resorting to a piece of paper. But because trust is an issue, that is why the world is as it is now. But blockchain technology is there to help us to ensure this trust. So now, what then is blockchain verification and its significance? So before I delve into the issue of blockchain technology, first of all, I would like to show you how this whole blockchain thing works, right? So first of all, there is transaction initiation. So transaction initiation can be something like um, a, um, someone sending, maybe a user of a cryptocurrency sending cryptocurrency to another user. Or it can be recording a contract, or it can even be maybe casting a vote in an election. That is the transaction initiation. And then the next thing is transaction verification. So the verification is done by a network of computers, also known as computer nodes, right? So the nodes um, authenticates the details of the transaction and also the validity of the transaction. So that's how the verification comes in. And after it is being verified, it is added to a block. And every block has an amount of, I mean, an amount of information that is able to contain. So once it reaches its maximum, a different block is created. So after it is added to a block, the block is also added to a chain. And that is where we get the concept blockchain from. So blockchain verification is the process of confirming the authenticity and validity of transactions and data within a blockchain network. As a decentralized system, blockchain rely on consensus mechanism to achieve agreement among multiple participants, known as nodes. On the state of the ledger, verification ensures each transaction adapts to predefined rules and is legitimate before it is added to a new block. So significance of blockchain verification. We have trust and security. So one thing about blockchain verification is that once a, once a transaction is verified, it becomes encrypted, right? So when it becomes encrypted, it means that it becomes temper-proof. Any attempt to temper with any of the transaction would mean that you have to temper with the subsequent ones. So which makes it practically impossible because the whole, any, any transaction that is entered becomes transparent to all the people in the, within the network. So trying to temper with any of the transactions would mean that, I mean, it becomes visible to the other people. And of course, by then you would have been caught or even be arrested. We also have immutability. It means that once a transaction is being entered, it cannot be changed or it cannot be altered, right? It becomes immutable or it becomes temper-proof. And we have eliminating intermediaries. So before, when people enter into transactions like, I mean, 
trading on cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, they need the bank or the government to serve as intermediary. So with blockchain, you don't need any intermediary because it is there to ensure trust between two parties who are entering into a transaction who do not trust themselves. I hope I'm making sense, right? You, you appreciate it? <clears throat> trust and security. Okay, so I've already explained this. So immutable and temper-proof records. One of the key features of blockchain technology is its ability to create immutable and temper-proof records. Each transaction or piece of data is stored in a block, which is linked to the previous block, forming a chain. This chaining mechanism ensures that any attempt to alter or temper the data in a block would require altering all subsequent blocks in the chain, making it practically impossible to manipulate the records without detection, just as the earlier explanations that I gave. So it is immutable and then it is temper proof. Once a transaction is recorded, it's very difficult for you to, to change. I mean, altering rate is, is practically impossible. It enhances data privacy. With the traditional centralized systems, individuals often have limited control over their personal data. The integration of blockchain technology can empower individuals by giving them ownership and control over their data. By leveraging cryptographic techniques, blockchain allows users to securely store and share their data while maintaining privacy. So the role of blockchain in overcoming trust issues. Blockchain technology at its core represents a paradigm shift in how we record, share, and maintain data emerging as the backbone of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Blockchain stands out for its unique characteristics. Essentially, it's, it's a digital ledger that records transactions across numerous computers. This decentralized nature ensures that no single entity has control over the entire chain, making it transparent and incredibly secure against fraud. Yes, so like I said, Unlike the traditional centralized system, whereby we have the government or the bank controlling the whole system, with blockchain verification, it is decentralized, right? Meaning that the individuals themselves have control over their own transactions. So let us look at the issue of decentralization. So unlike the traditional centralized system, blockchain operates across a network of computers, ensuring no single point of failure. Because it is decentralized, there is nothing like censorship, right? Because if the whole thing is controlled by the government or the bank, there can be censorship. But because, it is, because of its decentralized nature, there is nothing like any point of failure or censorship, right? Transparency and immutability. Once recorded, the data in any given block cannot be altered retroactively without altering all subsequent blocks. Miss Claire, right? Consensus algorithm. This are protocols that helps all the nodes in the network agree on the validity of transactions, enhancing trust. All right, so now, like I said, we start with the blockchain the technology. Now we've looked at what blockchain technology is. We've looked at blockchain verification. Now we are going to merge it with digital influencers. First of all, we are going to look at who an influencer is, a digital influencer is, and then after that, we will merge it with um, how the digital influencers can leverage on the blockchain technology to provide transparent and then um, temper-proof records. So the question then lies, who is a digital influencer? Having so many likes on Instagram, or having an Instagram account, and then having so many likes and so many followers does not make you a digital influencer. Being a public figure does not also make you a digital influencer. A digital influencer is a person who is able to create a content, and that content is able to impact followers or consumers. So any person who is able to create a content, and that content is being able to influence followers and consumers becomes a digital influencer. So a digital influencer is a person who creates content through digital channels, whose authority, knowledge, or 
position in the online media can have the power to impact the purchasing decisions of their audience. A digital influencer actively engages with their distinct niche through regular posts, sharing their knowledge and expertise on a specific topic. Influencers can include celebrities, models, athletes, designers, cooks, and other public individuals, but they can also be your next door neighbor or the person that you even grew up with. Yes, so a digital influencer may also refer to as internet celebrity. It may also refer to as digital marketing, also social media marketing, influencer marketing, and virtual influencer. So for the sake of time, I'm going to leverage more on influencer marketing, right? So when we talk about influencer marketing or what comes to mind when we say someone is an influencer marketer? Can anyone help? An influence, when we say someone, we talk about influencer marketing, what comes to mind? Anyone? Um, what comes to my mind is um, like a vlogger advertising a product on his or her vlog. That's what comes to my mind. Okay. Thank you. It's it's when some it's when you try to make a purchase decision based on the person and not the product itself. Okay. Nice one. Uh, what is coming to my mind is like, um, I feel like they are the marketing agency that they trying to promote the, uh, they trying to have her influencer to be like. A, popular or something like that. Okay. So about influencer marketing, when it comes to my mind about like a brand that will involve a, a sustainable influencer with their brand or their products in their marketing strategy. Like they can like increase their brand awareness or they can like increase their sale. So like influencer is someone that will create more like connection between their brand and products with their consumer. So this is All right, thank you. In fact, give them an applaud. <coughs> yes. You are all right at the answers that you gave. Yes. Everything that you said is in relation to influencer marketing. So in simple terms, an influencer marketing is all about celebrity endorsement, right? Celebrity endorsement. So let's say, for instance, um, I'm a I own a company, and then I manufacture soda. And growing up, the only soda that, for me, I know is Coca-Cola and Pepsi, right? And then I also manufacture soda, and then I want to bring it to the market for consumers or purchasers to patronize my product. Of course, I may not have the opportunity to reach the purchasers or the consumers on a personal level. So in that case, I find someone who already has influence over these consumers or the market or the target group that I'm looking for, someone who already has influence over them. And then I collaborate with the person and then the person will advertise my products to them. Does it make sense? Yeah, so that's what influencer marketing is all about. So it's about celebrity endorsement, having a new product. And it's just like um, when Pepsi came into the system, they contracted Michael Jackson to advertise Pepsi for them. And they paid huge sums to Michael Jackson then. You understand? So influencer marketing is all about, I mean, some sort of celebrity endorsement. And one thing about influencer marketers is that they can influence people to patronize your product. Because according to data, so many people make purchasing decisions based on the recommendations that they had from people that they trust or from influencers that they trust. Okay. At the same time, too, they can also influence people to boycott your product. Recently, when um, the, this footballer, Cristiano Ronaldo, was being interviewed, and then he had Coca-Cola in front of him, and then he took it off the screen. I don't know if some of, some of you watched that, that video. He took... Yes, you took it off the screen. Yes, and it, it cost Coca-Cola huge sums of money. Yes, because Cristiano Ronaldo has influence over what? Followers. 
So the, by virtue of the fact that he not drinking coke alone influenced some of what his followers. In digital marketing, where influencers wield significant influence over consumer behavior, the need for transparency and authenticity has never been more crucial as the influencer marketing landscape continues to evolve Innovative technologies like blockchain are emerging as powerful tools to address challenges related to trust, fraud, and accountability. So let's look at some of the importance of influencers in promoting blockchain technology. So advertisers and brands are unaware of how advertising money is used. Digital advertising is complicated. And ad fraud is widespread, and a lack of transparency and accountability cost marketers and publishers considerable money and a big budget. According to Forrester, up to 56% of all displayed advertising revenues are lost to fake inventory, with the cost of ad fraud predicted to reach $50 billion globally over the next decade. According to research on programmatic advertising, 79% of advertisers voiced concern about transparency and strong brands such as P&G are beginning to reduce their media spending and demanding complete transparency from their digital agency providers. So you now see the need for blockchain verification here, right? You see how, I mean, fraud and then um, insecurity is causing these advertising companies. So now let's look at how blockchain verification supports influencer marketing. Blockchain technology, which is commonly associated with cryptocurrencies, is revolutionizing several other industries, in addition to banking. It has a significant impact on digital marketing and advertising, challenge, advertising changing fundamental practices and providing fresh approaches. In the realm of marketing and advertising, Blockchain could be the change that facilitates a new way of how business interact with consumers, manage data, and carry out transactions. The revolutionary potential of this technology is becoming more and more apparent, and it develops changing the way marketers interact with consumers and guaranteeing security and transparency in the digital space. So now, here is how blockchain technology is helping in terms of digital marketing. So by providing a secure and temper-proof record of transactions, businesses can use blockchain technology to increase transparency and trust between themselves and their customers. Blockchain technology can also be used to create a temper-proof audit trail, which can help businesses to prove that they have adhered to certain standards or regulations. By sharing data on, block, on a blockchain, businesses can create a trust-based ecosystem in which information is shared and verified by multiple parties. By using smart contracts, businesses can automate the verification and enforcement of certain business processes, which can help to increase trust and transparency between business partners. Of course, everything that has positive, of course, has negative, right? Yes, no matter how good a thing is, of course, there are some negativity attached to it. So blockchain technology also has its own challenges. Yes, so for the sake of time, I will, I will speed up. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at the future trends and explore some of the upcoming trends, blockchain verification and influencer marketing. So blockchain has the potential to disrupt traditional influencers marketing platforms by facilitating the creation of decentralized marketplaces. In this platform, brands and influencers can connect directly, eliminating the need for intermediaries. This decentralized approach reduces fees, increases efficiency, and allows for more direct and transparent collaborations. So we see how blockchain technology can be able to help in terms of influencer marketing. Yes. In a situation like this, it increases fees, it, it, it reduces fees, and then increases efficiency, right? Because it ensures trust in what in a decentralized world. Reducing intermediary cost. 
So as we already said, when we talk about the intermediaries, we are looking at the banks and then we are also looking at the government, right? So with blockchain technology, we don't need intermediaries whenever we enter into a tra transaction or whenever we do a business, okay? And then also there is a direct collaboration. Okay, so my time is almost up. So to wrap up, business runs on information, right? And the more accurate we have the information and the faster we receive the information, the more we have business efficacy. So blockchain has come in order for us to have trust where there is no trust. It is therefore, I mean, two parties to enter into a transaction. Those two parties who do not trust themselves to enter into a transaction, whereby the transaction will be secured, it will be temper-proof, and then they can be able to have business efficacy. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we go to our next speaker, you know what I want you to do. Do you have your phones with you? Okay. Do you have LinkedIn in the phones? Okay. Can you open LinkedIn for me in your phone? and wave it up like this. Okay, do it, super. If you open LinkedIn and you go to the search bar, just next to the search bar, there is a button that shows a QR code, okay? Can you do that? Super. Just next to my code, there is a scan button, okay? So you have my code and scan button. Now I want you to scan the QR code of your next one, okay? Scan the QR code and then show the QR code to the next one, okay? One scan the QR code and connect to each other. It's like professional dating, okay? So scan the QR code of each other and connect to each other. You can play this game also during the breaks in order to connect to everyone in the room, okay? Super. I will show you mine during the break. I will have it here in order to scan everyone. Super, can I have your attention now? No, not yet. <laughs> the next keynote is about digital transformation of newsrooms and the new information paradigm. A huge applause and welcome on stage, Ludovic. They are still connecting to each other. We need to, great. Thank you, thank you very much. We are seeing uh, like a, uh, this is the YouTube that we need to see? Okay, great. Which one should I use, this one? Yes, yes. Hello, hello. And I play it, right? Or you launch the video? Should we start? Yes. 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 Yeah. There is no sound. Can, can, can you put the sound? Okay. Let's start again. Though. Let's start again. Because be, before we get the start, we need to give a proper applause to Ludwig. So come on. Thank you very much. Thank and after you. that, probably you will have a sound. Let's hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK. So let's start with a video. It's a bit of a wake up call, because I, I know it's nap time. Uh, yeah, but still we don't and have a sound. We still don't have the sound. But we will find it. In the beginning, we said you to know, do the demo issue, right? Yeah, yeah. You it's went okay. through that. 
Ah, always, always. Always. In the beginning, we said to it do a small stand-up together. Huh? Okay. No Let's full screen. It. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Come on. Come on. You like football? Yeah. Yes. Don't say soccer. What you see is what you get. Look at this. We can stop here. Sounds that you love this video as much as I do. And thank you very much for having me here, especially to you, Nikos, for inviting. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ludovic Blecher. Um, I'm from France, so you get used to my accent. Um, I'm a journalist, a tech entrepreneur, and an innovator. Uh, today I run an advisory uh, company called Ideation, and my role is to help publishers, journalists, and news players to manage change, and also for all, um, including questions that goes to AI implementation. Uh, prior to that, I spent 10 years at Google, and uh, I was leading their uh, global strategy for uh, stimulation of the news ecosystem. Um, and I created a global project I will talk about later. Uh, today, we're going to speak about newsroom transformation, especially in the context of AI. So why did I start with this video? Uh, I think it says a lot not everything, but a lot of the question you should ask yourself as a journalist or as a publisher when it goes to AI. Should we trust what we see? Probably not. Uh, how to keep providing and monetizing complexity in a world of entertainment when people prefer to believe what is shared by others rather than uh, what is shared by uh, the, what used to be the trusted sources of information. Um, there are tons of questions, and we can continue uh, back and forth with those questions. But today, there is clearly an hype about AI. There is an hype overall, and especially in news and journalism. In news and journalism, I would say that it is a mix between hope, excitement, and fear. And there are good reasons uh, for fear and to be scared in this world of journalism. Not only because AI is carrying the risk of taking up on the journalist jobs, but also because AI clearly challenges the core mission of what is to be a trusted sources of information. So prior to dig uh, deeper into this topic, 
uh, I, I encourage us to zoom out a little bit and take a bit of time to understand where we are because sometimes I feel that we've seen this movie before. Uh, who in this room is a new subscriber? Who has a subscription to a, uh, to a newspaper or to a digital? Two uh, percent? Three percent? Four percent? Well, that's quite depressing, right? <laughs> and I wouldn't mention, but they are not the youngest in the room, right? So we need to work on that. But 14 years ago, and that was in The Guardian, we were wondering if the iPad would save the newspaper. Guess what? It didn't. And some people uh, think the same about AI. And AI is not that new. We need to look at this chart and remember, back to 1970, Marvin Leminski, a computer scientist, said from, tr from three to eight years, 1970, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. This is yet to happen. So we are not there yet. And um, th this is available online, but it's really interesting to keep in mind that Generative AI is probably new, but not everything about AI is. So um, there is a, what I call an elevator dilemma here. At Google, I spend uh, almost uh, 10 years working on global projects to stimulate innovation. Long story short, we injected about 250 million for innovative projects in news. We uh, selected more than 6,000 projects in 115 countries. So that gives you a view of what's going on in that space. And uh, my two key learnings are first, that tech overlap is sometimes killing what we can consider as cutting edge innovation. The tech overlap is basically that everyone needs the same kind of tool and rather than having it on the shelf as a self-service, what do they do? They all develop and put same money to create the exact same tools, which is a waste of time, but more important, a waste of focus because it means that the competition is not at the right place. If I want you to become a subscriber, if I want you to engage more with what I'm producing, I need to make sure that the competition is in newsroom about news, about providing exclusive information and invest into human people to produce those information. And we should always uh, keep that in mind. Um, so, what, what happened to the news industry is pretty simple. Basically, and, and this is from 2012, right? So again, remember of the past, but when we started having this massive digital disruption, the ad sales of newspaper uh, basically went completely down when the total digital market went up. And we had the feeling as a news publisher that we would have a part of the cake. That did not happen because the newspaper digital ad sales stayed basically flat and things moved to platform basically. I'm not saying that a uh, platform are responsible for that, not at all, but the news industry in some way missed the opportunity at this point. Um, and honestly, no one quite understood how things really quickly uh, fall off the cliff. And one of the things we realized at that moment is that there is no silver bullet anymore. We used to be able in this industry to kind of copy paste. So we had tons of news magazines pretty similar and room from the business model for everyone. That's not the case anymore. You cannot just copy what uh, someone else is doing. And uh, there is a massive struggle for sustainability. And when you look especially at the small and medium uh, players, sometimes that are digital only or very often, they are very often more innovative than the incumbent. But problem is that they are struggling like crazy to monetize. So this is where uh, solutions are absolutely needed. 
and um, it's not an easy one. So uh, people came uh, with this idea uh, uh, around 2010, 2012, started booming those idea of a paywall. So you enter into a, a website, you want to have your information, you hit the wall because you have to pay for it. But I uh, cannot say that it worked everywhere, but it has been a good solution, especially for the big players, and also uh, managed to diversify their business model. So diversification through events and this kind of stuff help really to uh, sustain more journalism. The problem with those paywalls is that the real quality stay within the global elite, stay within the bubble. So how do you uh, address the problem of public interest journalism where you need to make sure that the good quality information is also flowing down so everyone can access to it. If it's not the case, democracy is in danger. Um, so now let's go back uh, to our topic with all what I've said in mind. So always keep that. So generative AI, new opportunities, no questions. What are the main opportunities? It's around operation efficiencies, code saving, and of course, at the end of the day, the creation of values. So it helps to uh, pass complicated net data to create online interaction and conversation, and that applies to news, of course. You know the content generation, but also customize specific models. So you are a news player, you can have uh, the, the ability to create personal assistants that are uh, working on your content and or, or all the data you have. So uh, many opportunities that goes way beyond just the creation of content, but probably even more opportunity in kind of business intelligence application. How will you reduce the churn? How can you predict uh, people that will churn? How can you engage more? How you, can, can you uh, make more recommendation to do con uh, content discovery, which is uh, super important for publishers? So if we look at Conscious of the time, okay. Um, so if we look at the major commercial use of AI, it's interesting also to see how it's been applied to uh, the specific industry of news. Uh, so first, the recommendation. So you have a content you recommend another one to discovery. So this is what is done, for example, on Next on YouTube, right? And uh, journalism also create all the news players, they have uh, the increased reader retention by recommending more article. Also example is image recognition. This is something journalists use to make investigations. So for example, they've detected illegal mining uh, using uh, satellites imagery. Um, of course, the big data uh, language model and uh, it's used for AI powered search. And um, in newsroom, we use that a lot, for example, for triaging questions uh, around the pandemic at the time of COVID coming from the readers. And um, that can be used also for event detection. So commercial use is gonna be more uh, detection of frauds using um, uh, the credit card. But uh, in journalism, it can be used to detect um, the, uh, the breaking news in social or the weak, uh, the, the weak signals in uh, social media, for example. So th those are kind of application uh, in news. And um, the Associated Press, they categorized uh, basically what is relevant for uh, AI, AI in, in the context of um, news production. So it's about news gathering. So you, you, you the newsroom uh, pass some data around specific event, transcribe and engage in fact checking. It's about news production and new di distribution, how do you distribute the content. Um, what I would say here is we don't really care at the end of the day about those categories. What is really important, and always keep that in mind, and I think it goes way beyond journalism, is no try to make sure that the problem you are trying to solve can be solved with AI. If it's the case, start to work on it. If it's not, I mean, humans are still pretty relevant, right? 
Um, so where do we stand uh, in the industry at the moment? And uh, this is a great research that has been conducted by Felix Simon from the Oxford uh, Internet Institute uh, at Oxford. So first, why do news or um, adopt AI? Of course, technical uh, advancement and change, market pressure, and guess what? Like everyone, hope. Will it help to uh, figure out new recipes? Um, how is it applied? So most of the time at the moment is about production. How do you simplify the workflow? So for example, auto-summarization, uh, um, generation of keywords. So something that helps you to, um, to, to kind of streamline the, 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 the tasks that are demanding but that are not adding values. And it's about news distribution. Plus, all the productivities with dynamic paywall, automated transcription, that is a huge opportunity for publishers as well, data analysis, um, and a lot of business intelligence application. But what we realized as well is that sometimes there is an illusion. And the illusion can be the output of uh, artificial intelligence because what will work for 95% of the industry is not acceptable when you are here to certify the information. You need to reach the 100% certification rate. And this is where it's becoming complicated because you have an output coming from the uh, artificial intelligence and you need to double check. Double checking can take more time than creating it and having uh, just people working on it. And this, this is what we see especially with uh, generative AI at the moment. Another uh, big question about um, AI is uh, the dependency with platform. Uh, most of this tech is coming from platform and uh, if you take aside the biggest newsroom, most of the newsroom will depend even more on the technology provided by the big players and uh, big platforms. And uh, you can see here uh, two uh, completely different approach. Um, in the US, the New York Times sued OpenAI and Microsoft for copyright work, right? But in France, Le Monde, which is the biggest newspaper in France and digital player in France, they reach an agreement and a partnership with OpenAI, right? So th those are uh, really two approaches. The risk here is to see the incumbent being be stronger and stronger and the new player having hard time to disrupt because they, they will have only uh, pennies of or tips of this uh, big cake, right? Um, Another example here is uh, a product that has been tested in newsroom, in some newsroom, uh, created again by a big company here. And uh, as you can see, it says that it's an assistant for journalists. So basically, uh, it, it takes some uh, like press release, for example, and is able to provide as an output a full article, right? So in this case, as you can see, the mistake and typos are still human generated, but I prefer typos by a human than a fact that are not uh, fully checked done by a machine. And I think having this kind of uh, dependence with platform is a real issue. That's one of the reasons we created um, uh, this tool, this content management system, because I really think that the role of tech is to help with news distribution, with monetization, but we shouldn't go into content creation. That's not the role of technology or it starts being dangerous. Technology should stay as neutral as positive and role of platform should be to surface quality information and um, recognize who is at the origin of an information. Um, to wrap this up, uh, I will use always this, uh, uh, what I call the beer analogy. And this is another risk uh, for news uh, players and news industry and journalism is the lack of diversity. Um, in the 90s, Heineken was about to take over on the world market, almost the world market in beer. Um, so everything would have looked or had the, the smell of a green bottle 
uh, luckily some smart people created those small brewery that are working for some of them very well. And there are some analogy with uh, the news ecosystem. And if you look at the tips provided for people that wanted to create those small brewery, you can say um, that some stuff completely apply to news player, especially exploring other revenue streams. This diversity is very important because even if uh, uh, some big players are the most relevant today, the more you have uh, information that is um, in, in, in ends that in the same pair of hands, then you are at risk really to have um, a, a, a lack of trust because you trust the diversity, you cannot trust only um, a small set of players. Um, last but not least, uh, think where we are about AI. And again, it's to keep in mind, we speak a lot about artificial intelligence, but being intelligent doesn't mean being smart. So AI is not smart at the moment. AI is in some way weak. They design specific and limited tasks. Generative AI is getting closer to being intelligent, but this is basically mainly statistic model at the moment. They don't think. Even if OpenAI and DeepMind were created with the stated goal of creating what we call artificial general intelligence, this remains mostly science fiction today. So we are not there yet, and um, this is probably a good news. So if I have one recommendation to make um, uh, to news player is embrace innovation, of course, but never be uh, mystified. Think about first what is your editorial value proposal, what do you want to provide to your reader, align the business model uh, and with your vision, and see where the innovation can fit and serve the ambition to engage better with your audience with uh, quality journalism. Um, I think I'm on time. If you want to engage, um, you, you have here uh, my contact. Uh, feel free to reach out. And I'm happy to take a uh, question if there are questions in the room. Do we have any questions? Okay. Uh, give me, give me, I will. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, since last year, uh, we conducted uh, our research and we interviewed uh, TV journalists in Indonesia and how they perceive the, the implementation of AI in replacing News Anchor, for example. Uh, but uh, we found that most of these journalists tend to be uh, more reluctant in embracing the technology, but we we uh, hypothesize that I think the, the the main problem is about the the economic issue within the newsroom itself, rather than then the the adoption of the technology because they're afraid that if the newsroom implement AI that it will replace the journalists or they will get laid off. So I would like to hear your opinion about this issue. Thank you. Well, this is absolutely correct, and that's why I wanted to state a bit uh, where the industry is in terms of uh, business uh, situation. Because, of course, the more you are struggling, the more you, uh, you are scared. But I think it goes beyond this time. Because this is not just about losing uh, jobs. Of course, there is a fear here. But it's also, for the first time, in some way, uh, losing your soul as well, right? Because you have a machine that might provide something that will be more trusted. It doesn't mean it's more true, right? But it can be more trusted by people. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a fear for really, uh, and a threat for journalism core mission. So it goes even beyond the classical fear. And I think we are running ah, you're, you're, you're doing yourself. Uh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, one last question uh, because we are. I think my question is, it's regarding journalism. Right now, journalism is sensationalizing AI in a negative way. And, you know, it's, it's very frustrating that there's not so much news about 
you know, AI in done in uh, good, AI for good, such as when AI advances in medical field or in nutrition, in stuff like that. So, so my question is primarily how 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 does you know journalists stop you know sensationalizing negativi negativity of AI regarding that? So look, um, the, the, there are many answers to this question. So first of all, I think that. Um, the question is not just about the journalist, but also the audience. I would be happy to conduct a research with you and really check if there are more articles that are criticizing AI, that article that report about how AI help about science, uh, you referred before to cancer detection and this kind of stuff. There are a lot of articles. The truth, they create well less engagement because people are not interested by what goes well. They always criticize journalists for uh, talking about what goes off track. But when you try to just provide positive news and uh, be problem solving, most of the time you are having very hard time to engage your audience, and that's not what people will pay for. So there is a kind of chicken and eggs issue. So let's say we are both responsible. Thank you, thank you very much. A huge round of applause. And uh, let's welcome our next keynote speaker, uh, Kim Meng, how blockchain can revolutionize entertainment. Kim Meng, the floor is yours. Hello. Okay, cool. Hi everyone, this is Kim Meng. Um, it's an honor to be here to share my knowledge about blockchain. And let's, take to the, let's go into the lighter side of things, um, how blockchain can revolutionize entertainment. Oops, it's not working. Okay. So um, let me first build a little bit of trust by introducing myself. I have 16 years of tech experience building mission critical system for banks, airlines, and government agencies. And I have five years of Web3 experience, been building in Web3 for five years. I started Game Economy in 2018, focusing on API, SDK, and private chain development for helping game developers to get into Web3 gaming easier. Then in 2022, we got acquired by iCandy, which is the Australian listed game developer company. They want to go into Web3 heavily, and then we are here to help them. We then got rebranded into Hashcode Studio. I also seconded as CTO of ZK Candy, a layer two chain founded by iCandy and ZK Sing. I'm also running a project called Future Girls Inc., a Web3 AI companion running on ZK Sing currently. Next, please. These are some of the projects that we have done. Any chess uh, project um, from Anibuka Brands and chess.com. Uh, Legend of the Mara is from Yuga Labs. And also we have done a side scroller game for Cool Cats as well. Next. I think by now you guys should probably have a lot of understanding about blockchain, but just let me go through it again so that um, you guys have a stronger understanding. Yeah, let's take the journey. Is it working? Next button, right? Okay, let's, let's take a journey through the evolution of the internet, right? At the very early days, internet was just a collection of static web pages where information can be published but not interacted with. We call that Web 1. Then came Web 2, which transformed the internet into dynamic social spaces where a user can contribute contents and interact with them on the platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. But this platform has centralized control and ownership over the user data. Now we are moving to the era of Web 3, a paradigm shift towards the decentralization, 
user sovereignty and peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So instead of relying on centralized server and intermediaries, Web3 application leverage on blockchain technology to make sure that it can operate in a trustless and decentralized manner. At the heart of the Web3 is blockchain technology, which offers several key features that differentiate it from traditional web architecture. Number one, decentralization. Ensures that there's no single entity control over the network. Make sure that there's no censorship and single point of failure. Number two, immutability. Once data is recorded onto the blockchain, it, is not, it cannot be updated and tampered with. This makes sure data transparency and um, integrity. Number three, cryptographic security. Protects user privacy and make sure that user can sign transactions securely without the need of intermediaries. Then came the Ethereum. We call it the world computer of the blockchain. It fundamentally transforms how we conceive and execute decentralized application. At the heart of the transformation, it is smart contract, a self-executing contract that have terms of the agreement written into the code directly. It executes on Ethereum virtual machine and the blink transparent and decentralized execution of the application. Then we also need to understand about assets tokenization with the use of NFT and fungible token. NFT allow tokenization of unique and indivisible assets such as art, music, and collectibles. It allow creation of digital representation with provable scars and ownership. On the other hand, fungible token provide a mean of tokenization for interchangeable and divisible assets such as currency, commodities, and securities. So with these two of tokenization mechanism, there are going to be a lot more blockchain use cases in various sectors, including entertainment. First, let's start about decentralized gaming. Decentralized gaming found its beginning with CryptoKitties, a blockchain-based game with its adorable cat collectibles. In the game, player can breed trade and own digital collectibles in a form of cat, and these cats are actually NFT. And these NFTs are provable scars, allowing players to truly own and trade their digital pets. So CryptoKitties demonstrated the potential of blockchain technology to revolutionize gaming by introducing true digital ownership and scarcity in a fun and engaging way. Next, Axie Infinity brought the decentralized gaming to a new height with its play-to-earn model. In the game, players battle with other players with a, a fantasy creatures called Essies, so players can earn cryptocurrency rewards by engaging in the battles, um, breeding the Essies, and also engaging in an in-game economy. So these games has created a thriving ecosystem because players not only play the game, but they also can earn a living by just playing it. It just shows the power of blockchain and decentralized gaming as a, as a whole. So what is really important here is that blockchain empowers game developers, especially the smaller ones, to create economic in-game economy. Now they can govern the in-game transaction, um, the transaction of their in-game currency in the form of token, or their in-game items in the form of NFT without the need of building a very complex marketplace or decentralized exchange. Next, I want to talk about event ticket sales. So last year, I have an opportunity to share my thoughts about ticket scalping issue happening in Malaysia to DH Malaysia. So um, what happened was that ticket scalpers buy concert ticket at original price and then sell it at the secondary market at exorbitant price. So I uh, proposed a blockchain solution which turned the event ticket into what we call a soulbound NFT. Soulbound NFT is the type of NFT which tie to the individual forever. With the help of an effective eKYC solution, the concert organizer can actually bar entry for any concert goer whom the identity doesn't match with the ticket holders. And concert organizer can then create a secondary marketplace to govern the sales of the, sec the, the concert ticket in the secondary market. Now, they can actually set the secondary price and ticket scalpers can no longer work in this case. What they can do more is that turn the concert ticket into a dynamic NFT. What it means is that before the concert, the ticket could look like a ticket, right? But after the concert, they can turn it into a collectibles with which the fans can keep it forever. Next, I want to touch to digital rights management. 
So by, by tokenizing digital assets and encoding the ownership right into the smart contract, the creators and the right holders can securely manage and monetize their digital assets by en ensuring fair compensation and royalties. A blockchain-based digital right management solution can track the usage and distribution of their digital content, make sure there's no piracy and unauthorized distribution. One example, last year, Justin Bieber released a collection of the NFT for one of his 2015 song called Company. So I actually minted one. So this has demonstrated that how can to make use of blockchain to distribute the royalties effectively to the right holders who are the NFT holders. Now, community building in NFT space has flourished with collections such as Bored Apes, um, Azuki and Pachi Penguins. They become more than just digital collectibles, but a vibrant communities with holders and enthusiasts. Bored Apes, for instance, started as a collection of Ape NFT have quickly transformed into a close-knit community of members and holders. These members, they organize events, collaborate on projects. They also organize in real life events, so creating connection beyond digital realm. Then the Ape Foundation emerged from the Board Ape communities. It's a grassroots initiative that protects the collective benefit of the uh, members. So what began as a loosely association of the members has transformed into decentralized autonomous organization, DAO, which is governed by the members via community voting and community participation. The Ape Foundation has already foreseen many initiatives such as um, donation in real life event, also collaborating in the projects, um, in, especially in the entertainment space. So what is important here is that it shows the power of decentralized governance and community driven stewardship in NFT space. And uh, individuals are empowered to come together to create something really special, especially in the entertainment space. Last, I'm going to touch about decentralized identity. This has transformed how we manage our identity in the entertainment space. So what we created is a sober NFT, which tied to an individual, um, which we, en we enable true ownership and uniqueness. In the gaming world, it just means tying a in-game currency items or characters to a player's decentralized identity. Make sure that they can retain the ownership of their identity across platform and games. What can do more is that by storing in-game achievement and in-game um, reputation onto the blockchain, we provide a verifiable proof of their skills, achievement, and conduct. As decentralized identity evolves, um, it truly transforms how we interact transact and engage in the digital world, unlock new possibilities. So blockchain offers enormous potential, but it is hindered, the mass adoption is hindered by several key challenges, such as user onboarding, scalability, and gas fees. As of now, user onboarding issue has been addressed with technologies such as account abstraction, custodial and non-custodial wallet, which provide an very easy user onboarding process, especially to a non-technical user. Meanwhile, scalability concerns have been addressed by layer two solutions such as ZK Sync or ZK Candy. It alleviates the network congestion and improves the tr transaction throughput. By batching the transaction together off-chain and settling them onto the main blockchain periodically, layer two solution significantly reduce the gas fee while maintaining the security. I truly believe by resolving all these challenges, we can see mass adoption, especially in the entertainment space in the near future. As it stands, blockchain has a great potential to truly revolutionize gaming, from enabling true digital ownership to community-driven content creation. Blockchain promises a more decentralized, transparent, and inclusive entertainment ecosystem. The journey has just begun, and the future of blockchain in entertainment space is truly exciting. Thank you. Do we have any questions? We can get one question. Any questions? Okay, yeah. Thank you.
First of all, thank you very much for sharing. Um, I'm a believer and also an enthusiast for Web3. In fact, I also own some digital collectibles, so I could relate to most of what you said. Cool. Um, so, so I would love to hear a bit of your perspective because uh, I've been in the space as well for quite a couple of years. We know that the last couple of years, um, the digital collectibles, so the NFT market has been taken quite a bit hit. And, and a lot of it position it also as you know digital collectibles, the entertainment part of it. So from your perspective, how do you see you know the the sentiments or the climates of this, you know, perhaps in the short and the medium term, uh, when it comes to you know these digital collectibles or NFTs being part of the entertainment side of, of it, if, if that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. First of all, um, not financial advice. Of course not. <laughs> um, basically, my thought is that um, when something new is created, there, also, there will always be hype, right? Once the hype is over, it's a time where builders come together and then make real use case of this. NFT has a lot of use case, and then what we've seen here, right, all the communities building, is just the beginning of what can happen in the future. Like, for example, we see the cycle of um, crypto kitties and crypto kitties, um, having issue because of gas fees, and then they're moving to another blockchain. Bored apes, for example, their, their price is getting lower and lower. But I think it's very important for us to really don't see, look at the floor price, because the floor price is really, it's about supply or demand, right? So when you create enough use case, enough utility that people really want your NFT, then you don't really need to worry about floor price. It's always about creating utility, creating use cases. So um, market sentiment is low. Um, for NFT, simply because there are a lot of distraction. Like now, we have layers on BTC, we have runes have coming out, uh, hardening as well. So I think it's very important to really look at the utility as we, as a instead of um, we are a builder instead of from the angle of a DGen or investors. Yeah, that's what my thought. Thanks. Great answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Any last questions? We have one more. So. We will get some financial advice more because we are in a bull run. So, <laughs> um, thank you for sharing. It's um, an you. amazing session. So, um, my question is, okay, um, how do you envision like AI-driven NFT um, project contributing to significant social impact, particularly uh, particularly in um, areas such as environmental conservation, community empowerment, or the preservation of cultural heritage? Okay. Thanks. Um, first of all, environmental issue got to be solved at the blockchain level instead of um, NFT collection itself because um, energy being consumed by mining and then we're moving towards PO, uh, proof of stakes and that really makes sure that there's no uh, additional energy consumption required. Um, I think that, that environmental issue can be resolved by that. And then second is the community building. So NFT project is always about community because um, it's almost, it works almost like a membership kind of thing where you buy the NFT, you join the club, and then you enjoy the benefits or you enjoy the vibe, you like the utility. So this is always ongoing um, and you, it will never be stopped. So community will always be the forefront in terms of NFT projects. And then finally is a heritage. I think that really depends on the person who built the use case, right? So for example, you can come up with an NFT that really um, protect your heritage of your traditional um, heritage, for example. And then um, what, you can, what you can do is that make use of the royalty, make use of the royalty to make sure that you keep, I mean, you protect your heritage. That is really down to the, the builders themselves to create the projects. But, now the, the power of blockchain is that it empowers builders to build something bigger, right? In the previously, when you want to build something like this, you probably you need a 10 people programmers team and then you build an infrastructure and things like that. But now probably you only need one person, like one programmer and one artist, then you can do something big. So I, I would think that this is, if this is something that you aspire to do, I would encourage you to do that. And then um, probably you will add to the use case of um, how blockchain can protect the heritage in the future. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. If you do it, give us some airdrops or something in order to move yeah, forward. That'll be great. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, we have a uh, coffee break now. 
uh, for 30 minutes. So w one, one final thing, if you are one of the people that Alex will interview, you know who uh, you are, please find him here now in order to conduct the interviews today. Okay? Oh, in half an hour, okay, yeah, 3.30. Uh, the four ones that you are, you know. If you don't know, search for me, okay? So, uh, we have a break. Uh, in 30 minutes, we are going to do here a general assembly in order to give you uh, the different rooms and the numbers of the different rooms. Uh, while you're drinking your coffee, visit the corners in order to learn a thing and get a sticker, okay? Thank you, thank you very much. Let's close this and go for coffee with a huge round of applause. Thank you.